Estas son las mañanitas que cantaba el rey David y hoy en Code for Lib <laughs> te cantamos así. Despierta, mi bien despierta, mira que ya amaneció y a las pajarillos cantan. Ya la luna se metió. Hi. It's traditional to start Code for Lib with a song. I can't sing. I'm a terrible singer, um, except for um, that one song at karaoke, which we won't talk about. Um, <clears throat> So, no show tunes for me. Um, I have things I need to read, um, and I hate Macintosh. Um, oh, no, don't switch desktops again. Come on, thank you. All right. Why are you even on a different desktop? No, I don't want you on a desktop. Uh, right, fine, whatever. I'll figure it out. I was trying to get show notes on, on there, and, but whatever. Not show notes, I was trying to get the, the, the carousel of slidey goodness on there and the other thing on here and now they're on different desktops and i don't know that's it that makes me sad welcome thank you for joining us at princeton uh so i hope people who were here yesterday had a chance to go to newcomer dinners and it was awesome um there were lots of good restaurants uh, first thing on my agenda is to introduce Ann Jarvis, Princeton's Dean of Libraries and Robert H. Taylor, 1930 University Librarian, and then I leave the stage and Ann has stuff to say. So, I'll be back. Ann, where did Ann go? Ah, here we go. All right. Good morning. This conference gathers on the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Lenape people. And I want to begin by paying respect to them and other indigenous peoples, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Lenape diaspora. Welcome to Princeton. I hear some of you have had quite an adventure getting here, um, yet that that you imagine were perhaps more central than we are. So I thank you for your adventurous spirit in getting here. But it's great to see you all and to be able to share our libraries and our campus spaces. Um, welcome also to everybody who, who is joining us virtually. Our library, which serves researchers from around the world, is a vibrant hub of activity with a campus-wide presence through nine locations. I encourage you to learn more about our library's North Stars and to read our DEI statement at library.princeton.edu slash about. In response to researchers' changing needs, we're proud to have developed many advanced online services, such as control digital lending and our virtual reading room, which securely di deliver digitized content from our repository to our patrons via our catalog and finding aids. We're also active in open and digital scholarship. And Tiger Data, a collaboration with our Campus Office of Information Technology, is about to make 100 petabytes of storage available to our 1,200 plus campus researchers to support the active use and long-term preservation of research data. Our talented library IT staff are key to our successes. Among our world-renowned collections, I'd like to highlight the papers of Nobel laureate Toni Morrison. We currently have an exhibition at Firestone Library featuring her papers, Toni Morrison, Sites of Memory which has been critically acclaimed, and I hope you'll find a little bit of time to visit the exhibition while you're here. So now, before the conference actually begins, I'd like to actually take a moment to thank the many people who were involved in its organization. Kathy Azevedo and Jen Cumming from Concentra for all their organizing legwork. Yay! <laughs> Princeton University Library staff, especially Esme Coles and Kate Lynch as our local organizers. <laughs> 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 
Clear as our financial host, and of course, our many financial sponsors. And last but not least, the dozens of volunteers who coordinated everything from pre-conferences to scholarships to t-shirts and social activities. <laughs> Welcome again, and I hope you enjoy your time here in Princeton. Thank you. Thank you, and all right, now I say more things. Um, <clears throat> we cannot make these conferences happen with each year without our sponsors, so a big thank you to the following organizations that helped make it happen this year. Uh, our platinum sponsor is Ohio College Library Consort, OCLC. Um, <laughs> Our gold sponsors are Blacklight, EBSCO, ask someone at EBSCO about the pecans, uh, For Science, uh, Princeton University, which is here for hosting, and their generous sponsorship of the reception, which has a meatball buffet. <laughs> Our bronze sponsors are Index Data, University of Michigan Library, University of Pittsburgh hyphen University Library System, Rockefeller Archive Center, Johns Hopkins University, School of Communication and Information at Rutgers University. Our contributing sponsors are the School of Information Sciences, comma, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, uh, Rice University Fondren Library. End of sponsors, thank you sponsors. All right, uh, perhaps the most important thing on this morning's agenda is connecting to Wi-Fi. To connect to Wi-Fi, if you have Eduroam, congratulations, you're already on Wi-Fi. Um, or you need to register your device on the PU Visitor Network. Instructions to access um, are, were shared in the Know Before You Go email, which is somewhere in your email, which you may not be able to get to if you're not on Wi-Fi. You can see how this could be a problem. Um, but I'm sure you'll figure it out. Uh, do, 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 do. And also in Slack, same, same deal. But a lot of you have Slack on your phone now. So maybe, I don't know, I still have this thing. So I don't know. Uh, I don't have Slack on my phone. Uh, ba, 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 ba. In-person presenters and question askers need to speak into the microphone to ensure that everyone, including speakers, attendees, live streamers, and live transcription service transcriptors can hear what is being said. We'll have mic runners in the room for audience comments. Also, a note on using a handheld microphone. It is a piece of food. You want to hold it as close to your mouth as you would a piece of food just before you eat it. Also, the piece of food you're eating is a candy bar, not an ice cream cone. Candy bar, not ice cream cone, candy bar. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. <clears throat> All Q&A for remote speakers will take place on the hashtag CodeForLibCon Slack channel. There are sign-up sheets for today's lightning talks and tomorrow's breakout sessions out in the lobby. Some of the breakout sessions are on the wiki for some reason. So if you put a breakout session on the wiki, just duplicate it over on the easel. Um, if you are a newcomer, I, I strongly encourage newcomers to sign up for lightning talks because you'll only be embarrassed for five minutes, maximum. Um, OK. There, to, to, now it says, display this page and scroll to the appropriate section. So I will do that. Oh, but I need to plug in the thing because the monitor situation, Macintosh, I'm just going to blame Macintosh for everything. And I'm going to wait for Extron to catch up. Let me just remind it that I'm on a laptop on the HDMI. It's waking up. And... Hey, okay, so now I have to click on this thing, the schedule. Oh, no, I don't want the projector. There, no. It wasn't. <laughs> the guys in the back have got me. Thank you. <laughs> 
All right, I, I need to leave time for the keynote. Um, all right, so I'm supposed to click on this thing and scroll to where we are. Oh, okay, because I'm supposed to, but you see the problem here is I can't read the notes while, it, am I just saying who the, okay. I'll read this and then I'll switch to the community service volunteers so that you support volunteers so you can see what they look like. All right, we have the community support volunteers, or CSVs, which does not stand for comma separated value in this case, here to assist attendees. You can find their schedules and photos beneath the conduct and safety section of the website. They will wear black and white striped lanyards, which are very distinctive, to identify themselves. The community support volunteers for this morning are Sujong Herring and Francis Kaiwa. Oh, gosh, every time. Kaiwa until 11 a.m. So let's see. Um, that Here we have, okay, here's Sujong and here's Francis, so you know what they look like. So commit those those faces to memory, and are are they here? Where are, where are oh, okay? There's our official community support volunteer seating is in the back center. If you need to find them during the time that we're up here, all right. I'm just going to let you see all these these notes here because I'm tired of wrestling with monitors. Uh, yeah, Macintosh, I don't want to right click. Okay. Um, in the afternoon, we will have Andromeda and Bess. So here's Andromeda Yelton, cat not included today, and Bess Sadler, who are probably somewhere. There's Bess, and there's Andromeda. But they will be in the Magic CSV seats in the afternoon, I assume. Okay. Tomorrow, we have, we'll have other different uh, CSVs, so stay tuned. The online community support volunteers are Esme Cowles, who is ES Cowles on Slack until 11 a.m., and then Kevin Rice, Kevin Rice on Slack, and from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Lan every time. Lanyard colors and what they mean. If it is green, it is okay to photograph this person. Implicit consent given. Uh, if it is yellow, ask if you would like to, to photograph this person or capture them on visual media and then respect their wishes. And then red is uh, do not take a picture of me, do not ask to take a picture of me, leave me out of your, your video capture devices. All right, and there are also buttons that are social distancing comfort level and interaction level buttons. There is a red scare, red, <laughs> <laughs> red square. <laughs> Both of those phrases are fraught with meaning. Um, red square, not red scare. We're in Moscow either way, maybe. Um, focus on social distancing and limited interaction. Wait for me to initiate an, a, any interaction if I wear a red square button. Yellow bar buttons, uh, masks and or social distancing required, but I am open to interaction. Green circle or no badge means I uh, res please respect my boundaries as I bring them up, but other than that, generally accepting of social interactioniness. All right, at this time, if things were not, what time is it? Oh, yeah, I, at this time I would normally go through the Code for Lib intro for newbies, but I've wasted a lot of time breaking stuff, so uh, I will skip that. Um, and now I have to unbreak things to get our keynote, Dr. Lydia Tang, slides ready, um, and I will read our bio. Dr. Lydia Tang is an outreach and engagement coordinator for Lyricis. Previously, she held archival, archivist positions at Michigan State University, the Library of Congress, and numerous graduate positions at the University of Illinois, where she received her MIS and Doctor of Musical Arts degree. Uh, passionate about accessibility and disability representation in archives, she served on the task force to revise the best practices on accessible archives for people with disabilities <gasps> and spearheaded founding the Society of American Archivists Accessibility and Disability Section. She is the 2020 recipient of SAA's Mark A. Green Emerging Leader Award and was recognized in three SAA Council resolutions as a co-founder of the Archival Workers Emergency Fund for spearheading the Accessibility and Disability Section's Archivists at Home document 
and for guidelines for accessibility archives for people with disabilities. In addition to her professional service with SAA, she has contributed to accessibility initiatives within DLF Digital Accessibility Working Group and the Archive Space Open Source Software Community for leading the Staff Interface Enhancement Working Group Development Prioritization Subteam, founding the Usability Subteam, and sharing the Users Advisory Council. She has written about accessible physical archival spaces, hiring and advancement practices, and is currently co-editing a book with Dr. Grayson Brillmeyer, Preserving Disability, Disability and the Archival Profession. Please welcome Dr. Tang while I fix your slides up. All right. No, 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 no. Go away. You can go away. Where? Slideshow. <sighs> okay. Hello, every everyone. I'm towering above you today, uh, thanks to this uh, stool. I'm actually pretty short. And I'm very pleased about this. <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, thank you so much for um, the invitation to speak here today. I'm excited to join your community, and I'm honored uh, to fill this role. I first came to accessibility as an advocate and ally for my legally blind uh, partner. I wanted to show him what I did as an archivist but it quickly opened my eyes to seeing obstacle after obstacle, from finding aids that were read by screen readers incoherently, to blocked image PDFs, to bumping and tripping in a physical space. It's hard to explain to someone that they are welcome when there are so many barriers to overcome, which is why my professional activity has ever since then been devoted to accessibility. In my own work, I've taken a multi-pronged approach to accessibility, helping to build standards and communities of practice and addressing accessibility in the technology we use. I've been very active with the Society of American Archivists, an organization I will refer to going forward as SAA, uh, by serving on this task force to revise the best practices for accessibility and founding the uh, accessibility and disability section. I also volunteered for several years with Archive Space, making accessibility recommendations and getting accessibility tickets into the development queue. The irony of me standing in front of you as someone with anxiety isn't lost on me. When I panic, my mind goes blank, which might sound zen, but it definitely doesn't feel that way. Hence my script. As someone who is neurodiverse but might not otherwise look disabled, I also feel the weight of imposter syndrome and the knowledge that I am taking space that could be for someone else. So I acknowledge that I'm not speaking on behalf of all disabilities and that the extent of my expertise has strengths and weaknesses and that we all have expertise to share. Why does accessibility matter? Accessibility is an essential factor for determining if something can be accessed by disabled people or not. The, the 2020 documentary Crip Camp is a rich resource for learning about the decades of disability activism which brought about protections for disabled workers, accessibility requirements, and eventually the Americans with Disabilities Act. This Im image of, is of people with disabilities protesting in support of the ADA in 1990 at the US Capitol, crawling up the 83 stone steps of the building, a building that was both literally and symbolically inaccessible to them. This is at the heart of accessibility. It is more than mere compliance and deeper than just headings and color contrast. It is a crucial factor of equity and inclusion that we should all strive to meet. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, one in four US adults live with a disability. Most people will experience disability, whether temporarily or permanently during the course of their lives. If you've sprained your ankle and needed to use crutches or a wheelchair, that's an example of a temporary disability. And navigating in a world designed overwhelmingly for people who can walk suddenly becomes an eye-opening experience to begin seeing pervasive barriers that others experience on a daily basis. 
Accessibility benefits everyone, such as this image implies. Accessible design is also important to state, um, is also paired with concepts such as universal design and inclusive design, but it's also important to stay centered on its roots of social justice with dis for people with disabilities who are often erased and minimized. Why are we thinking about accessibility today? We've been in a pandemic for three years and we're excited to see our colleagues in a physical conference again. There's been a lot of pain and trauma over this period and we're looking forward to happier times. But as we resume in-person conferences, meetings and work, as someone speaking about accessibility today, not in the spirit of politics, but simply to state facts, there are some people who are not in this room today who are perhaps absorbing the talks through the live stream or recordings, but otherwise are unable to fully and interactively participate. For some people with weakened immune systems, chronic pain, migraines, exhaustion, or other conditions where they need to manage their physical needs and comfort, in-person events are closed off to them. For others struggling with limited or no financial support, or, any, or our caregivers or people needing care, in-person conferences are also out of reach. So we need to understand who is not included and why. And I challenge us as we resume normalcy, how can we reimagine a more accessible future? As stewards of collections and sharers of knowledge, we want people to access our collections and our services, and we want to be useful and make a difference in people's lives. Accessibility is like a bridge between your collections and the knowledge you steward to the users. If there are holes or gaps, it won't be effective. This is a picture of Hunter's Point Library, which in 2019 unveiled its $41.5 million new building, only to realize that the fiction stacks were accessible only by stairs. This other image is of my friend using a wheelchair and being unable to open our legacy reading room door, literally unable to access our collections and services. This happens on a daily basis for people with disabilities in large and small ways. To look back over just the past 100 years, so much has changed. To be disabled often meant being hidden away from society through social stigma and unjust laws. Now disabled people are among us. There are ramps, curb cuts, and many intersections have audio signals for crossings. But these supports have not always been there and were hard won after decades of activism. For people who haven't experienced disability, it can be difficult to pick up on inaccessibility because the status quo centers non-disabled people. We don't notice inaccessibility because it doesn't impact us. We don't see disabled people struggling in the system because they've already struggled so much that they know they are not welcome. How can we avoid these frustrating situations? Let's look for patterns of inaccessibility. Number one, assuming that everyone has the same ability and can perceive the same thing. This is a vision simulator by Lighthouse for the Blind on what someone with macular degeneration may experience with their vision. My partner also has low vision, but additionally is colorblind, and his screen magnifier is set to a high contrast mode. With the screen magnifier, he sees a line of text that basically takes up the entire screen, like the narrow view of someone looking through a straw. He reads word by word, line by line, and gets lost if the layout is confusing and visual centric. Now I will play one of a few demonstrations by Dr. Jeff Swada. The first one will show his experience of a Gmail interface, which is remarkably different from what I experience as a sighted user. So this is a standard view of a Gmail account, uh, somebody who's not using an accessibility feature. Um, if you scan over to this uh, computer, this is the same Gmail account, uh, but using a high contrast mode through Microsoft uh, Suite. Uh, so again, you can see some of the features are kind of more faded out, a little bit harder to see in some cases. Uh, and then if I turn on Zoom text here, this is what somebody sees when they're uh, magnified, a very small portion of the screen. So again, depending on what accessibility features you have, uh, there's something to think about when you're designing a platform or a website, um, how people are seeing what you're designing.
So this is Number two, lacking the flexibility to accomplish things in multiple ways. Have you ever gotten tripped up when starting, to, uh, starting a curried coffee maker? It's very prescriptive in its order of adding the pod in the water. Or is that the other way around? <laughs> Workflows and tools that require the user to think and operate it in a rigid way cut off people who don't or can't function in that way. Instead of bending the person to the tool or workflow, how can you get it to mold to the person and their needs instead? Being able to go into settings of your phone or computer and change the font size, font type, and toggle on the dark mode are examples of being adaptive for the user. Here's an example of a font designed especially to be dyslexic friendly, which has subtly thicker lower halves of the letters to keep the letters from being mentally transposed. Number three, accessibility as an afterthought. Here are some pictures of legacy accessible seating in a lecture hall. They are old, decrepit, and conventional seating that seems to be accessible only by its location at the front of the room. It also harkens to an outdated and offensive term for disability, uh, handicapper, which, uses, uh, uh, which harkens back to historic connotations of disabled people as beggars. Accessibility needs to be intentionally built into every facet of our world, and it's easiest to plan it from the beginning. If we wait until the end, it will undoubtedly always be more expensive, to more time-consuming, and more convoluted for actual people. At this point, I wanted to take a slight detour to talk about how we talk about disability. Some people really dislike the term special needs, and yet it is ubiquitously used in society. Think who uses this phrase. Is it disabled people talking about themselves or is it non-disabled people talking about disabled people? Disability historically has a lot of stigma, so using euphemisms like special needs, while the intent might be to avoid a negative connotation about the word disabled as in lacking ability, can actually be interpreted as further stigmatization and imply that accommodations are special or optional. Person-first language like a person with a disability was an approach adopted in the 1970s to emphasize the humanity of the person with a disability, but many people, particularly deaf and autistic people, prefer identity-first language such as disabled person. Notice how disabled people describe themselves and use their terminology. Accessibility should not be considered a niche topic for only experts and professionals within the field to engage with. Sure, it takes a lot of learning to become familiar with the standards and begin to see patterns of inaccessibility pervasive in our world. Uh, but the advocacy work and the creativity to continue to evolve and improve accessibility requires the insight and engagement of everyone, regardless of your role within an organization. Getting connected with a community of practitioners makes it easier to learn as you go to advance accessibility at your own institution and on the profession-wide scale. Part of my own journey has been seeing the need for change and getting involved, whether I felt qualified or not, and learning by doing, because action is better than not doing anything and hoping someone else will, because what if no one does? To educate yourself about accessibility, there are free and paid professional development programs and a formal certificate through the International Association for Accessibility Professionals. I'll share some communities of practice to consider getting involved with. SAA's Accessibility and Disability section was founded in 2019. It is the home of the Guidelines for Accessible Archives for People with Disabilities, a standard the section will be updating this year. We have a mentoring sign-up sheet, an anonymous Q&A form to generate conversation around sensitive topics, and a blog. We were recognized in an SAA Council resolution early in the pandemic for our Archivists at Home document. The crowdsourced Archivists at Home document is what I consider to be an example of community approaches to engaging, to addressing an emerging issue. In the early weeks of the pandemic, repositories were closing rapidly across the world, and archivists were getting furloughed and laid off. The section began compiling work from home ideas because one, 
there could be an assumption that archivists could only be productive if they were working with the physical collections, and we needed to quickly show how productivity could happen at home to keep jobs. And two, if archivists could work remotely in this case, why can't it be possible going forward? This is particularly relevant for archivists with disabilities. Now, having personally transitioned to a permanently work-from-home job, I understand it isn't an ideal lifestyle for everyone, but it has been a sanctuary for me and others who find liberation beyond geographic location and an in-office environment. A year later, we issued a survey to gather testimonies on how this document was actually used, and here is some of the feedback that we received. It helped advocate for my use of working from home, which was needed in order to protect my health and keep my job. It allowed us to successfully advocate for the continued employment of our student assistants and gave them meaningful work to do during the shelter in place order. Another group to consider joining is the Digital Library Federation's Digital Accessibility Working Group. Since DLF doesn't require individual membership dues, it's easy to get to, to join and get to work. There are subteams for IT, policies and workflow, and advocacy and continuing education. They have robust documentation, accessibility testing guidance, and their accessibility advice for online conferences is widely referenced resource. Trying to get to know the Code for Lib community better, my coworker invited me to the Slack channel. There are so many knowledgeable people in the accessibility channel who I'm sure would be happy to help anyone learn more. Congratulations on already fostering a strong culture of accessibility. Another community of practice to consider is ALA's Universal Accessibility Interest Group, which is an email listserv with conveners to help with discussion of accessibility. Informally, there are other communities as well. The Twitter hashtags CripLib and LIS Mental Health have insightful discussions. The LIS Mental Health uh, uh, produced the Reserve and Renew Zine, which recently discontinued, and has a website with robust resources on the intersection of library and information science workers and mental health. The A11Y for the 11 characters of the word accessibility Slack channel is for anyone studying for accessibility, particularly certification with the International Association of Accessibility Professionals. There are educators, technologists, and a wide range of disciplines active in the space. I also wanted to showcase the Disability Archives Lab, directed by Dr. Grayson Bromeyer at McGill University, whose research focuses on amplifying the voices of disabled users, archival workers, and disability collections. I'm currently co-editing a book with Dr. Brillmeyer called Preserving Disability, which will be published by Litwin Books in the coming year. It's a compendium of chapters from disabled researchers and archival workers on facets of disability in the archives profession. What are some main points to know about accessibility? Since this is a conference focusing on the intersection of libraries and technology, I wanted to do a brief summary of key aspects of digital accessibility, but feel free to talk to me afterwards about physical accessibility if you have any questions. Standards for web accessibility are articulated in the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines maintained by the W3C and other standards. Much of the guidance is applicable for general digital accessibility. Some essential accessibility components include using headings, alt text, and establishing a good level of contrast, and I'll go into more detail about each of them. It might seem for sighted users that formatting of headings can just be a clunky way to change the font size, but these are actually crucially important for screen readers to navigate to the section they are most interested in. For sighted folks, we can visually skim to find what interests us. For people using screen readers, facing a wall of text, you don't skim, you plow. And dealing with a stream of words is time consuming and aggravating. Screen readers can also skip around hyperlink by hyperlink. And one of the most common accessibility annoyances is having link with descriptive text of click here and here. Can you imagine how a screen reader would read that? If there's one easy way you can make an accessibility difference, it's by making your hyperlinks descriptive and avoid the click here text. 
Here's an example of how a visually designed word archival finding aid might appear. To someone cited, it might seem pretty innocuous and wouldn't raise any red flags in an automated test either, but let's play the video on the next slide to learn how a screen reader reads this. This demonstration is by Dr. Jeff Swata. So here's an example of something that just looks visually nice but doesn't work very well with the screen reader. It reads down the column but doesn't necessarily make any sense to somebody reading with the screen reader. Box one. Box two folder. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. <laughs> so here you could see it read off the box and folder numbers first but it never got to the title, so somebody using a screen reader has no idea what these numbers are for. 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56 box title, meeting minutes logo designs, newspaper articles, correspondence lyrics, correspondence newspaper articles, photos, photos. So Next, I will show a demonstration of another type of visual formatting, how a screen reader interprets a table of contents. <laughs> Finding date for the Tom Moss Miller Papers MSS 683, Table of Contents. Summary information period repeated 114 times 4, period repeated 118 times 4, period repeated 106 times 4, period repeated 117 times 5. Since that went by really fast, what happened was that the screen reader was reading the formatting periods and actually skipped the rest of the content. I'm not entirely sure why the content was skipped, but it clearly misses the point. Choice of font and font size are important. Sans serif font as opposed to more script-like fonts are generally easier to read. Another best practice is to make sure to convey significance in multiple ways beyond only color. As I mentioned earlier, my partner isn't able to distinguish color at all, only experiencing shades of light. Here's an example of how Trello uses patterns and textures with their labels in addition to the color, although I note that their color contrast isn't exemplary. There's also an example of traffic lights, which use the red-green combination that is problematic for many types of color blindness. When thinking about web accessibility, basically the main points are to make sure that it is created right. If there's proper structures, contrast, and alternative text, you're nearly there. Most assistive technology is designed to work with well-designed websites, and that's usually sufficient, especially if someone is glancing at your site and moving on to other sites. Mm -hmm. Some institutions look into uh, tools such as overlays. Companies selling overlays basically say that if you invest in their product, they'll take care of everything. Overlays can be a nifty accessibility awareness tool where website visitors can change the font, font size, and other details. If anything, they bring attention to the types of adaptations that most disabled users use uh, in their personal setup. Uh, disabled users usually have a preferred tool that is intended to work across all platforms, including websites, files, and email. When they encounter an overlay, it can actually be more disorienting than helpful. It'd be like a runner needing to change their shoes with every new website. Overlays are controversial in the professional field of accessibility. They jam web accessibility auditing tools to make it look like everything miraculously is perfect, but it just obfuscates the actual condition of the site. Testing for web accessibility doesn't have to be intimidating. One of the easiest tools for basic accessibility testing is the WAVE accessibility uh, testing tool by Web Accessibility in Mind, or Web Aim. It's not the most comprehensive tool, but it's a great way to get a general idea of the accessibility of a site. You just need to drop the URL in, and it quickly generates an automatic report of both the issues and positive accessibility aspects of the website. I have it as a browser extension, so I can toggle it on even more quickly. The DLF Accessibility Working Group's IT subteam has a really great accessibility auditing shortlist which provides guidance for beginners on accessibility testing. Try using your own built-in assistive technology. I can toggle on TalkBack with my Android and my partner's Apple phone uses VoiceOver. 
Using a screen reader for the first time can be a very humbling and frustrating experience. It can help you appreciate the skill and speed that regular users have with their technology. You can also try other settings on your phone, such as toggling on dark mode or high contrast mode. The screenshot is an example of viewing the promotional a promotional email in dark mode and on my cell phone. And notice how the gray background and gray text intentionally, unintentionally blend together. Remember that there needs to be a diverse testing pool representing a range of disabilities and assistive tech. For example, someone sighted can look over issues that could be a blocker for someone completely without sight. Involve disabled users in user research and compensate them for their efforts because if something, even if something passes a test, it doesn't mean that it's actually usable or coherent. Another aspect that needs to be mentioned is cognitive accessibility, which can be more difficult to automatically test. Cognitive disabilities might cover learning, memory, processing, and comprehension. If your website has a long wall of text, no one wants to read it, whether it's by a screen reader or by sight, and no one wants to write it. So let's call it a truce. I'm only half joking. <laughs> Streamlining interfaces and workflows to be as simple as possible is great for accessibility. For example, someone requesting materials can, uh, can uh, sometimes requesting materials can get complicated. Click here, or click there, add in the box and folder information. Oh, what was that again? What's the date again? It can all become a barrier. So auto-filling forms and automating as much as possible makes things easier. Have you ever gotten stuck on a CAPTCHA? The screenshot is an example of a confusing CAPTCHA asking for images of buses when none are actually present. That's an example of just too many hoops to simply jump through to get to what you need. Since many of us deal with scanned documents, it's important to mention a few accessibility pitfalls to avoid. A simple scanned document is an image by default. When a screen reader encounters it, it will just say, image. If you want the content to be read, you need to run it through optical character recognition. For newer type documents, this is a relatively straightforward process, but if you have text formatted into columns like a magazine article, additional steps will be needed to add tagging for the text reading order. For older, less legible documents, in addition to the reading order, extensive quality review may be required. This is an example of how the OCR text might render, which is practically indecipherable for a screen reader. Accessibility remediation can be time-consuming and expensive, but while that can be off-putting, the fact is it must be done. How do people who can't see experience visual content? Their screen reader uh, in, might encounter an image and it might say, image. Or in this example from Facebook, it might give some feeble attempt at description. It says, may be an image of one person standing food and indoor. Is that even accurate at all? <laughs> Meaningful, coherent alt text needs to be concise, focused, and done, and shouldn't be more than a sentence or two. For this case, I've added the alt text, two children messily playing with their food. Yeah, they're my kids. <laughs> Captions help deaf and hard of hearing people as well as anyone who relies on reading to help with comprehension. Maybe they're accessing content in a language that isn't as familiar to them, or maybe they're in an area where they need to be quiet and not use the sound. Many caption services run through an AI tool that generates a baseline of captions. AI captions are generated very quickly, but can misinterpret words that sound similar. They often also require human review and remediation. This is the user interface for Rev. I got an SA Foundation grant to caption uh, pre-2020 SA education videos, and I worked with a great team of volunteers to QA the caption files. The editing interface is very user-friendly, and the pricing per minute rate made it easy to calculate the cost of the initial transcription. But a mistake that I made, and that I willingly share for others to avoid, was underestimating the amount of time and effort required to review and correct the captions. Captioning can also be a very time-intensive and expensive process, but needs to be done as well. Human-generated captions are CART, communication access, real-time translation, 
where the captioner uses a phonetic keyboard to transcribe content as quickly and accurately as possible. Another option is having an American Sign Language interpreter. It's impressive to see them use their visual language so quickly, skillfully, and expressively, although not all people with hearing disabilities know ASL. To be an accessibility ally, always budget for captions and arrange for either an interpreter or captioner during events. When you're on a Zoom call, be sure to enable captions. How can your website help users feel comfortable and confident visiting your physical space? As uh, an accessibility section on your web page would be the go-to section for someone with a disability wanting to see how inclusive your space and services are. This can be the deciding factor on whether to attempt to visit or not. Key elements of, for this section are demonstrated in Emory's Rose Library Accessibility page. It has the contact information of someone who can address accessibility questions and accommodation requests. It also shares accessibility features and then would ideally share any known shortcomings. One of the most annoying common pitfalls when talking about accessibility is to, is to assume an us and them stance. It can develop into a savior mentality that erases the fact that disabled people are among us and are empowered to help each other. We are colleagues and peers, and accessibility is as relevant to the workplace as public outward facing spaces. For example, providing job interview questions in advance or at least minimally in writing at the time can really help candidates put their best foot forward, particularly if they're neurodiverse. For archivists, having a weightlifting requirement in a job description can be a hurdle that whittles out many insightful and skilled candidates who could otherwise be excellent for the job with accommodations. And just a quick note about receiving accommodations, it can be a more daunting process than it has to be. For some disabilities, getting a formal diagnosis can be invasive and take uh, years. Disclosing a disability can be stressful, and taking that diagnosis to the right unit and developing a formal accommodation plan also takes a lot of time and bureaucracy. A truly inclusive work environment would anticipate accommodation needs and trust your staff and colleagues in their best intentions and be flexible to help them do their best work. So thank you for hanging on through this talk. We've covered a lot. In summary, here are some key takeaway points. Disabled people should not be the only ones advocating for accessibility. It can be burdensome, tiring, and traumatic. Be an ally by educating yourself about accessibility best practices and advocating for accessibility in every angle and in every way that you can. Hold others accountable for accessibility. If there aren't things that are in your control, such as databases or software, push the onus of accessibility up the chain. Ask vendors about accessibility. Ask them for a VPAT. And if they don't know what that is, that's a bad sign. It's a report that they or external assessors fill out that documents accessibility features and gaps. Finally, do one more accessibility thing every day. Code for Lib is a conference for coders in libraries. You are builders and maintainers who bring our digital dreams of discovery, access, and transformation to fruition. Keep in mind the patterns of inaccessibility. Build accessibility from the beginning and involve and compensate disabled users in UX research. And even if you don't code like me, think about some of the best practices that I shared with you and do one small thing every day. Even if it's as simple as making your hyperlink text more descriptive, do your part to help us move towards a more accessible world. And lastly, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today without mentors and collaborators who have educated and inspired me. The list is actually way longer than this, but I wanted in particular to give shout outs of thanks to Kathy, Tanya, Bob, Matt, Jessica, and Jeff for their pep talks and feedback in preparing the presentation, and especially to Dr. Jeff Swada for his screen reader demonstrations and the expertise he continues to share with me. I hope that you have a great conference and that my presentation was helpful for learning more about accessibility. We've got like 10 minutes for questions. Which I assume somewhere out there knows how the question running works. I'm just going to stand here.
Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I was I was struck by your question of who is not included and why. And I was wondering, so you talked about the patterns of inaccessibility, which to me is kind of more like how people are excluded. And I'm wondering, so the how and the why sounds a little more political. So I'm wondering if you could connect the patterns of accessibility kind of into the who and the why of it. And like how those patterns kind of have emerged maybe because of political reasoning. I hope I can do this on the fly. <laughs> That's a great question. And uh, a lot of it is structural, and a lot of it um, is political, too. Uh, so I would say that uh, sometimes it's just simply oversight, and sometimes it can be more intentional. Like, there used to be ugly laws. Like, there used to be very explicit, horrible laws that excluded disabled people. And, um, and, and then sometimes there's just, uh, when people are building a, a plane in flight, like the way that technology usually is, then it, uh, then it can just be plain oversight, too. Um, so I'd have to think more about that question to, to really um, dig into it but I hope that some of these examples are helpful. Hi, um, so as a manager of a digital collection, um, we have a lot of talks with our accessibility unit on campus about um, publishing items that, without transcripts. And I was wondering what you thought about um, kind of the, the, the backlog issue of having to edit transcripts for, um, for images that we publish and what is, what is kind of like the, the minimum acceptable uh, accessibility level um, if, if such a thing exists for um, uh, items that may not have a transcript but are in the backlog for having a transcript, whether we should go ahead and publish those or we should wait till everything has a transcript to publish those, because um, this is this is issues that come up a lot with our accessibility unit. Well, I think that if you if if you build it, they will come. As in, like they will. Uh, people will be able to discover it if it's available. Um, and so if you think about maybe an iterative process of description, like a, at least minimally a title with some key, keywords or something, that might be a way to um, allow people to discover something and request additional feedback. But know that at the point of requesting um, the ac greater access for these things, that's a barrier in itself, too. You know what I mean? Uh, so, um, so that's just something always to debate about right there. Yeah. My question's a little less technical, but in your kind of travels and adventures, where do you have an example of somewhere that has a very user-friendly or accessibly friendly um, experience for for your husband or your partner, and uh, and where was that? I'm trying to be better about using the mic. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, I was actually traveling in uh, Nova Scotia, and uh, there was this this uh, historic place that had a phone app that was really helpful for guiding uh, my husband through these spaces. Uh, so that's that was really inspiring to see. Um, so he could use the, the app for the guidance. He could also use it in his screen reader to access the exhibit descriptions and things like that. In that particular case, accessibility needs to be thought into every um, like, like I said, a bridge of accessibility. So it's one thing to be able to uh, listen to the exhibit labels, 
But if you can't find the exhibit in the first place, then uh, uh, then that's part of, part of it. Thank you. Um, so my question is, it kind of goes back to a few of these questions. Um, in regard to the, I guess, the politics of accessibility, sometimes it seems to me that when we're attempting to advocate for particular changes in institutions, it can seem to the institution like an indictment of their failings. And given the resource constraints of many institutions, it's, it's difficult to get money put towards different or new projects. And I'm wondering if you have any experience with um, kind of working up the chain of command or working with um, committees and if there are strategies for dealing with um, preventing that sort of um, light being cast on the, the endeavor of increasing accessibility. Right. Could you, actually I hate to do it, but could you uh, repeat your question to me again? I'm sorry. Thanks. Do you um, have any experience or examples um, about advocating for changes that increase accessibility um, that prevent a, a sort of political standoff or that um, prevent the um, it seeming like you're in creating an indictment of an organization. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, it's hard because um, with accessibility, it can often seem like it kind of like, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you didn't do this. Uh, so I would suggest focusing on the positives and the transformation of that. So, uh, so say if you are trying to seek funding or um, just have a dedicated project to really make stuff truly accessible. And, uh, and so you're saying, that not only is this going to help, that basically accessibility does help everyone, you know, and not only that, but it can be transformational in so many ways. Uh, in terms of, uh, you can go into uh, the 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 additional factors that can help with that, um, the additional factors that can that. Um, that can be unlocked from greater accessibility in terms of the metadata about the text analysis and things like that. And also, finally, there you can just bring on the cudgel too. Like maybe sometimes it does have to be a, a, a bit of a, um, a, a contentious face-off in a way of just saying that, look, we need it to be accessible because otherwise people will s sue us for this. And so if, if um, Appealing to, if if appealing to, uh, you know, the doing the doing the right thing is not even enough. Then sometimes that cudgel of uh, legal risk can be um, a stronger a stronger pull. One more. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Um, with so many facets of accessibility and your just kind of bird's eye view of what you've been looking at uh, for the last few years, uh, what's the lowest hanging fruit that we can all go and do right away that's you know relatively low effort and would make a, a world of difference for accessibilities in, in just about any library? Well, uh, so avoid the click here text. This is like <laughs> my main annoyance. Like we counter it, we encounter it so much and it's just, it's a stylistic thing that people kind of fall back on. You see it on websites for hotels, you see it everywhere. Click here, click here. So please, 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 if you get anything out of this talk, it's don't do that. <laughs> and then the other one is about uh, color contrast. So you might have seen, that my slides, besides maybe some uh, screenshots, are pretty stark. And so 
that can be really challenging sometimes. Uh, I know a lot of people like to use Canva for uh, designs, but actually there's a lot of accessibility problems with uh, those types of platforms. So as you're designing your own uh, presentations or your handouts or anything like that, uh, really uh, think about the, the contrast. Um, and also, finally, I mean, so here I am going with my patterns of inaccessibility. Think about how, uh, how people can access things in multiple ways. So uh, some exhibits may have a, like a large print kind of uh, handout that they can give out, but it only works for people who can see the font that's that big. But, you know, my husband actually can't see font that's this big. So uh, think about how people can access whatever you're designing, whatever you're building, whatever you're presenting in multiple ways. Thanks. All right, thank you, Dr. Day. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. We have finished. We've made it through the first half of the first morning of the first day. Oh, and a quick, a quick announcement has been added. Um, oh, yes. Um, there are people who are standing. If you have open seatage next to you, please raise your hand so that those who are waiting in the back can find a spot. While that happens, I will uh, give some input on what's happening next. It is 10.01. We have a scheduled break until 10.15, um, after which we will have our first set of selected talks. Um, speakers for the rest of the day, I suggest you use your break time to get your t slides ready. Um, also, if you are speaking in the next block, it might be well advised to sit close to the front of the room and or near an aisle, at least for the session that you're in, just to make things go quicker. Um, all right, go have a break. 10.15. No, I don't want another desktop. <laughs> no. All right, how do I close the, I, how do I close the desktop I don't want? No, I will, I will conquer it. I will conquer it. I will blame you for not getting my slides on. All right, I don't want you to anymore this desktop. How do I get rid of you? How? Mission control. Uh, one of these keys is gonna let, no. All right, someone else can do it. Okay, where's the USB ports? <laughs> so, oh, um, in that. Okay. All right, now I have to remember on how to use a Mac. Okay. Uh, I can't help you with that. I can probably help you. There we go. I had to like turn it three times to that's the USB rule. Yep. Put the below in it, too. This is uh, ironic, though. I mean, okay, Mac person, how do you actually uh, find where your uh, USB drive is? It's on the desktop. Okay. So, is it just... this one that I click? Yes. Question mark. Okay, well. Okay. Okay, someone's gonna have to do this because it's not liking me. <laughs> Honestly, a lot of Apple touchpads do not react to my skin. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but let's actually uh, move it to the desktop or someplace. Is, is it Command C to copy? Uh, I want to make sure we don't cut. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. I will use spacebar when I'm actually running the dang thing. What? Or is it like down there? <laughs> There we go. All right. Okay, cool. I'm just going to minimize that. Yep. <laughs> Next. Hey, your turn. No, it's right. Can I move this? Uh, yeah. I think that or was should... just for our... Um... Okay. I challenged. Yeah. I have no idea where this is supposed to be. Hmm, Chrome. Okay, there we go. We want everything in this window, I presume, or do we want to open a new one for this um, run? I mean, it, done it with looks that. like we got some uh, slides already. Okay. So. Yeah, we've been a little more seated in our pants than we probably really should, so we appreciate you guys sort of playing along. No worries. All right, now here's the here's the million dollar question. Do you have access to the OSF site to download from there? Um, we we should be able to download from the OSF. Yeah. So our problem is right now we're mirrored, which means I can't do that while they see that. The question is, can I monkey with this, or will I break everything? I should be able to revert. Mirror that I don't want to mirror. That looks better. What's that? There we go. Okay, Extron's off to the side. Do I have a cursor? Are you going through, uh, are you using Google Slides? Yeah. See how badly I messed things up? All right, so good news is that will work for me. The bad news is <laughs> for, for other people to be able to yeah, get to their slides. Yeah. Yeah, I know I'm not the only person who wants to do speaker notes. Yeah. Um, but... Um, Thing is, we need to minimize. I know the time as much between. Possible. Yeah. All right. I can. Um. I'll make it roll in. I just got to get my paper notes, and I'll just flip. If that's what your preference is. Yeah. Unless we can figure out how to get the notes working. I can make the notes. I have the power, even on a Macintosh. Oh, you got it. They work, but the problem is uh, then is other people... It's not janky, it's just when people want to add, like, other content, you can't, you got to, like, interact with the screen, you can't see. So you know we'll, I mean? just un we'll just... That's what we were saying. It when it's time for Are we cool with that? All right. All right. I'm good with that. I'll let you handle that part. I'm good with that, even on a Macintosh. I will tolerate... Did you switch them? You see, now that's a problem. Now that is a problem. How did you do that? Well... Oh, you switch which one's the extended and which one's the desktop. Nah, pain in my ass. Oh, there. Yeah, no, no, no. But what I was practicing was turning it off quickly Here. for the next person. I'll, I can make that happen. But... I'm at 1245. So right. no I don't care there. about you. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, 1245 is not part of this block. 
Lunch. Yeah. Uh, I am trying to. All right, can I switch? I want to grab the Chrome application itself and drag it back to this window and then just drag your single window over to the side. A little higher. That good? Quick. Yeah. No. Ah, all right. Left, 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 left. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, you could just turn that so I could see. That'd be awesome. All right. Thank you, Mike. With the, the low tech solution. All right, I'm going to tear this off. I'm going to put this here. I'm going to make this full screen. All right. That's a little bit more civilized. Alan is in this block, so he Wait, this 1245? When are we having lunch? No. 11. Okay, that makes more sense. All right. All right. So, in that case, you want to get your slides on. Okay, they're on the OSF site, or I can get them on Google Slides. Just whatever, whatever. How do I get to the OSF site? Right. Uh, Maybe <laughs> pull them up on Google Slides. <laughs> I can do that. They're good. <sighs> All right, let me. Is it like this? Go do it. We're just trying to like troubleshoot. Yeah. All right. So when when it comes to be time, do you mm -hmm. do you think I should use the slideshow feature? Like, how are you doing this? Yeah. Drop down and, and hit presenter. presenter view. And then you gotta send. And then I'll have to drag this over to the this other monitor. Yeah. Okay. Which cool. Is to the right. That hasn't changed. To the right. Okay. Cool. Thank you. And um, if you see Matt again or Kate, tell them. Like, people can start setting. Up I'm gonna the next. put mine there. So. Okay. People can start setting up the next deck while I take questions if I have time for okay. questions. Did you hear that? I did not hear anything. Okay, you said that when he's taking questions, people can set up the, the next slides. Which, Where did the sh go I don't know. I need to find the show notes, which are which oh, are yeah. gone. All right, then go to uh, 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 history. I'll just... Uh, 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 I'll just remember the URL. Yeah, it, look, it's auto -tick. Oh, there we go. go. Back, cool. Back. All right, where do you want me to stand while you're in here? You could stand behind me menacingly if you like. All right, is it that time now? We have two minutes. Hmm? Oh, yep. On your. So that's your window. Yes, yours is back there. You said time, and then this. Is yeah, that's true. You're spoiling your slides for everyone. I am. I want to make sure animation's working. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I don't want the dictionary. I never want the dictionary. <laughs> what is the dictionary? I don't know. It's some... I'm do touching... Oh, it's the hard press. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, know. Gentle. Gentle. I just want to be it's able to... Egg. I just want to be Hold able to click. Like I just want to be able to click. Holding things like an egg is for fencing. Your every grumble is amplified. Just, just. I know, I know. It's, 
I feel so powerful with everyone hearing my every complaint about Macintosh. Yes. All right. Hey, it's 10.15. If you're not in the room, then you can't hear me. So I don't know why I'm talking to the people not in the room. Uh, get back in here, y'all. It's time for the thing to happen. Bing, boom, bing. Um, that it seems to be working. I'm surprised. Okay. <laughs> All right. I will repeat the quick announcement from before. If you have a vacant seat next to you, please indicate so by raising an appendage of your choice um, so that those who do not have a seat can find a seat. Who is calling me? <sighs> All right. Okay, so, uh, um, all right. Okay. I'm going to wait for my phone to stop ringing in my pocket because then I can concentrate. All right, uh, so we are now, <laughs> it's now time for our group one of talks. Uh, timekeeper, do we have a time to keep? This is your timekeeper. Mike Kostelik, my colleague, will be presenting for 20 minutes on how to survive a disaster recovery. Um, let me get the window set up for Mr. Kostelik so that he is ready to go. And Mike Kostelik, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm very honored to kick things off again after that wonderful keynote by Dr. Tang. Before I start, I want to thank uh, all my colleagues involved in the recovery that I'm going to tell you about. And I especially want to recognize Chris Bowen, Trevor Thornton, and Brian Dietz, who did much of the heavy lifting for our end of the recovery, and Andrew Diamond, Flavia Ruffner, and Bradley Daigle at AP Trust for all their help along the way. Also, you may have seen another presentation about this very recovery by Bradley Daigle and Jill Sexton at CNI. Today, I'm going to go more operational than they did, but I'm not going to zoom into the finest details. Sorry, Code for Lib audience, there will be no code examples in this deck. But if you're interested in the nitty gritty, I'm happy to connect you with the colleagues I just mentioned. So without further ado, I'm here to tell you what to do when things go terribly wrong. Just kidding. There is further ado. I need to set the stage. So we formed the Cross-Departmental digi Digitization and Digital Curation. Shall I pause? As close as I can get. Oh, I'm more amplified now. Um, the Digitization and Digital Curation Working Group in 2016 to do stuff. Lots of good, much needed stuff. But the stuff that is relevant today is the last bullet in our charge, which I shall read. Review effectiveness of coverage and redundancy of the various digital curation and archiving, that is cloud, partnerships utilized by the libraries. We did exactly that and delivered a report in the spring of 2020 recommending that we go all in on AP Trust as our digital preservation storage. Now, here's a bit of foreshadowing for this zombie movie. From that report, we seek to safeguard against the following risks, including accidental action by staff. And to this, to wit, we recommend maintaining one archival copy locally, uploading the entire collection to AP Trust for preservation, and ceasing our use of tape backups for digital preservation. Fast forward a year to June 2021, uh, and I'm uh, astronomy.com headline there, solar eclipse. 2021, prepare for a ring of fire on June 10th. Now, I'm told by the always reputable timeanddate.com that the ancient Greeks believed that a solar eclipse was a sign of angry gods and that it was the beginning of disasters and destruction. In retrospect, this looks a bit like an ill portent. So let's zoom in now. We're at the moment in the movie where everyone is happily going about their day, unaware of the looming disaster. It is an ordinary Tuesday 
we notice that our storage array is growing low on space. We do something we have done many times before. We delete defunct data stores to recover space. All seems well until hours later, when the developer for our preservation application notices issues. So to explain what happened here, I have to rewind the clock just once more. This is what things like looked like at the start. It's pretty standard. On ingest, uh, that preservation application makes copies to primary and secondary storage locations. Mm, sure, thanks. Testing this mic. Good. Amplified. OK. Um, and secondary storage locations. And from there, we make off-site tape backups. Okay? But with the adoption of that cloud digital preservation strategy, things begin to change. We drop the secondary copy and the tape backups. Now the application makes copies to the primary and directly to AP Trust. The primary on-site copy gives us a belt and suspenders level of safety, should anything ever go you know, pear-shaped with AP Trust. It's also just convenient to have locally accessible copies to do things like fulfill requests from researchers or otherwise interact with that data without pulling stuff out of uh, AP Trust. An important thing to note here, we stopped using secondary storage. We didn't tear it down, so it's just sitting there still attached to the virtual server, but ignored, or if you prefer, lurking off screen. Then another thing happens. This is now a good nine months before the coming apocalypse. We start to run low on primary storage. Uh, hey, we think, we're not using secondary anymore. Let's grab that and use it. We extend the volume to include both the primary and secondary disks. Problem solved. Here is another thing to note. We don't rename that secondary disk or the data store behind it, because that's a pain to do. This is now a zombie. It is a ticking time bomb. It is a zombie time bomb. <laughs> so now we've uh, zipped forward. We're at the moment, back here at the moment of disaster. We need to reclaim space, right? We need to free up space overall in the array. We see secondary among the list of data stores available. <coughs> hey, we say we don't use secondary anymore. Let's delete that. So we delete the data store, which contains the secondary disk. The primary volume, understandably, I think we can all agree, is a bit flummoxed by having one of its legs kicked out from under it. <laughs> oh, bye-bye storage. <laughs> Pause for effect. <laughs> uh, tragedy plus time equals comedy. The operating system, of course, cannot make sense of this crippled volume. So now we're all caught up. To all appearances, our primary copy of our entire digital special collections is gone, gone, gone. This is an X parrot. Now, I think I have time if you'll allow me a short digression. At first, I wanted to illustrate this painful moment with what I think everyone can agree is a fitting image. I asked the big three AI, AI art generators to create a nuclear explosion with mushroom cloud on the horizon. In the foreground, foreground is the Titanic sinking with its bows sticking out of the water at night next to a large iceberg in the style of a color movie still, realistic, dramatic. <laughs> See the results. Mid-journey. <laughs> that is dramatic. That Titanic isn't sinking. Not even a bit. And someone invited a sloop to the party. <laughs> Stable diffusion. OK, weird, but OK. Dolly, my favorite. 10 of 10, no notes. Back to the show. What do you do when you've irrevocably deleted all of your special collections? Well, I'll tell you what I do. As a manager, I rarely, if ever, have the most expertise on the team there. If we're firefighting, my jobs are basically these three things. Communications, right? This is where I do have some expertise, and I have lots more time and attention for it than the people actually manning the hoses. So right away, I think about who needs to be informed, and I start compartmentalizing. I get the core people talking to each other in chat or Zoom. I send a quick informational message to the larger group of stakeholders. And I send an alert up the chain so they aren't blindsided by questions uh, about the situation and they can provide cover for us. 
I do want to stress here that intra-team communi communications are as important as anything else. I was confusion reigns in a crisis. You have to keep pulling people back into the main thread there to report what they're seeing and what they're trying so everyone's on the same page. Second thing I'm often doing is slowing things down or really slowing people down. So I often wade into the discussion to get everyone to stop with what could have happened and what are we doing about it, right? And park that discussion until we have clarity on exactly what the situation is right now, um, what the impact of this situation is, who's on the case and who else we might need to pull in. What possibly might have changed from the working state to cause this problem? And only then get into what careful changes we can try to positively diagnose the cause. And only then, with a clear diagnosis, get into the weeds of what it will take to remedy the situation. This slow down and look around uh, piece is needed because experienced people use heuristics to jump to likely answers. That's well and good, right? That's what lets uh, them, that's what lets us efficiently deal with the many problems they and we encounter uh, day in and day out. And it's how many outages can be quickly solved because someone recognizes the problem and knows, or at least can find out, the solution right away. But when you get into the stickier problems, when problems, when solutions prove elusive, confirmation bias can become a troublesome factor. People get stuck on pieces that point towards the first diagnoses that they make, and they dismiss contradictory facts that point in another direction. So besides those two things, there's sort of a third one that wraps them together, and that's just project management. And that I mean treating an outage and a recovery like any other project, often to the point of often tracking it, uh, actually tracking it on, on one or more cards on our uh, Trello project board. I'm working on that board, uh, or not on that board, but I'm working in general to pin down exactly what we're doing now or next or later, and what's the critical path here, and what can be noted and filed away for later work and, uh, and not distract us. Who's doing what and when? What is the current bottleneck and can we apply resources to it? And importantly, what if this is and isn't visible to our users, especially as we progress through uh, recovery? So I promised highlights and lowlights. And uh, here is where I step in it in this particular situation, at least communications-wise. Allow me to return your attention to this earlier snippet of our report. We identified a risk of accidentally deleting data. And we compensated for that risk by placing separate copies in AP Trust. So to me, this looks like, yeah, okay, we screwed up, but I'm happy like we thought about this in advance and we made preparations. All we have to do now, pull that data down. We're in the clear. As it turned out, this was an unpopular opinion. <laughs> in other words, when I said, our disaster recovery system worked, what people really hear, heard is, we did a disaster. <laughs> so the lesson here, at least for me, and I hope for us, uh, a uh, useful lesson for others is that you have to give people time to process the disaster piece before they can take in anything else. I, in this case, didn't put myself in other people's shoes sufficiently, uh, uh, especially at the outset. No permanent data loss is relatively good news, but relatively is doing a lot of work in that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> the immediate impacts were large and the recovery looked daunting to everyone. So dig into that plan. Uh, as I said, it appears to just be a simple matter of pulling that data down from AP Trust. Except we'd only ever tested pulling down a test file or two. We had no mechanism to pull down batches of bags, let alone terabytes of it. Even better, looking into AP Trust documentation quickly that uh, afternoon, uh, it itself, there, in the docs, there was no guidelines for doing a full restore or this kind of batched download. Uh, so we were in unknown territory on both sides. This is the low point where things look their most grim. It looks like we needed to restore everything. We weren't sure exactly how we'd do that. We weren't sure just how much it might cost us to download all that data, or just as bad, what it might cost our friends at AP Trust uh, in S3 fees, getting things transferred and out. And we thought it might take many months to get it all back. But from here, things started to look up. With a great deal of care, we were actually able to coax that primary storage volume back into life, minus the pieces that res re resided on that zombie time bomb of a disk. That cut the size of the restore we needed roughly in half, and then we linked up with the AP Trust team and grasped how we could, in fact, strip batches of downloads. And better yet, we determined that AP Trust could trickle out files at no cost to us and at minimal cost to them. And the trickle rapidly turned into a steady stream of downloads as they implemented improvements to their tooling on the fly. 
42 days later, we completed this restore. And yes, I thought of another visual guide here, but I couldn't decide between 48 weeks later reference or uh, Hitchhiker's Guide 42 thing. So let's just bring in a party zombie. <laughs> An important factor in our success here was that the preservation application I showed uh, is an independent system with uh, the inventory and fixity hashes for this data stored separately from the data itself and therefore unaffected by the loss of those objects. And that we could ID exactly what was missing, pull a manifest of what needed to get pulled down from AP Trust, and confirm those downloads against the original fixity. That was invaluable because while it's not as bad as a total data, data loss, a nightmare scenario after this type of situation is never knowing for sure if you've got it all back or not, having potential gaps. Another factor in our favor was that the punch list could be targeted against AP Trust API. That allowed us to be much more selective and targeted in our restores, and therefore faster than a previous strategy, which would have involved restoring everything from tape, and then from that giant restore, figuring out the pieces that we needed to move back into primary storage. There were some speed bumps along the way that I can share, though. One lesson here is that time matters. If you have a data loss, ask yourself, if you have a large data loss, right? Do you need pieces of this back before the rest? Is there an order that matters? When we thought we were looking at many months of very slow restores, we worried about our ability to fulfill research requests for any of this data. We spent a fair bit of time manually calling through the inventory of what needed to be restored and prioritizing the most important collections, piping those results into the schedule of batch downloads, all of which required a great deal of coordination. Uh, another thing is that, uh, another lesson here is that only a fraction of the total recovery time was due to actual data transfer speeds out of the cloud, even though most of the data was in deep glacier. That's the opposite of our expectations before this all happened. Um, nearly as much time as that was spent on just assessing the details of the data loss, coordinating between stakeholders, standing up recovery storage and tools, and verifying those downloads. Secondly, scale matters too. So we had figured as I said, how we're going to pull down these dozens of terabytes of data, but the question becomes, where can we put this all? Because if you flash back, uh, the, the triggering incident was that we were running out of space. So we didn't have space to pull down everything, run it through our ingest, create another copy uh, until we could release the downloads. So we ended up dragging retired array uh, out of uh, retirement back into temporary usage. But my advice to you, <coughs> excuse me, my advice to you is to think through the logistics and possible costs of a big restore. Here's another way scale bit us. Fun one. Our backup software takes a snapshot while the backup is running, naturally. If, if the backup takes many, many hours, like say because you shove multiple terabytes onto that disk, the snapshot grows the whole time the backup is running. If it grows enough, the extra space at the end of the virtual disk fills up, the VM gets frozen, and congratulations, you've got yet another outage in the middle of the recovery. That one was particularly fun to unstick. So the bigger lesson here uh, that I want to share is simply that complex systems fail in complex ways. Um, so we are, yeah, I pointed uh, earlier to one chain of events that led to our outage, right? An easy, digestible explanation. A quick change made nine months prior, reuse the existing storage without renaming it. But you can keep pulling on that thread to go deeper. And you'll find that we made uh, operating system level storage architecture decisions that contributed to this possibility. We had multiple people working on different ends of the dependency chain, which led to some miscommunication. We were working with a one-off configuration, unlike the rest of our environment, because of its size. Uh, and that led to misapprehension of how it worked. Neither our documentation nor our tools fully linked the half dozen layers of the storage stack from raw disks in the array all the way to mounted volumes on the server, leading to a misperception of the impact of making this change. And in preparing for this presentation, there are, were some things I didn't even remember until I uh, encountered them again. I actually canceled a meeting with our storage admin the morning of this incident. We skipped it because there was nothing much going on to discuss. <laughs> And just before I became aware of the problem later that day, I postponed another meeting because I wrote, I'm exhausted. My kid was up last night. So human factors can add to technical factors and so on. Uh, everything added up. Eventually, the straw found the proverbial camel, and uh, things progressed from there. So the deep lesson is assume everything can break and will break eventually and plan accordingly. Do your future self a favor. 
implement best practices in advance, yeah, but oh, also know what to do when things inevitably go sideways. Have a response plan. Practice your response plan. Test your restore plans. Do a tabletop exercise and walk through your likeliest scenarios to think through what you haven't thought of yet. And uh, lastly, calibrate expectations for the effort that will be involved in a recovery, any resources that will be needed, and what your forecasted timelines are. The end. Timekeeper, do we have any time left? All right, we have time for one absurdly short question. I see someone over here. So short. <laughs> um, could you explain from a channel chain of command a point of view without pointing fingers how the disaster developed in the first place? You know, the shoving around of volumes, and if you put any, um, you know, any prevention measures to to uh, avoid that again. Sure, yeah, and I would say we're a pretty small group. It's not so much chain of command, but we did uh, make improvements to our change management, which was very lacking, right? And there were some checks. There were some questions of, can I, can I delete this data store? Yes, you can. But it wasn't a formalized change management process of asking the right questions of the right people. And so we, we have definitely stepped that up. And for anything touching prod now, we do run through a, a standard template to make sure we're considering impacts. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> Up next is... All right, does this sound, mic sound better on YouTube? I can see, I don't know. All right, up next, Tom Robel, Stefano Kosu, Aaron Griffith with the Oxford Common File Layout, Understanding the Specification, Institutional Use Cases and Implementations. Uh, um, your timekeeper is this gentleman over here. You have 20 minutes. Um, and, uh, oh, where's, which one? You're here. It's here, but not right. have in there with my speaker notes. Yeah, do you want the speaker notes? Yes, All right, please. I will. Uh, I gotta do the thing. Oh, this it's not. Here. I have them here. No, it's cool. I'm gonna make it work because I'm gonna repeat this back in time. <laughs> I have a new. All right, I will make it, I will make it happen. I have a new bit.ly for it, though. This is one without. Can oh. I have that? Oh yeah, let's here, why don't you type in your your Sorry. new link? Uh t -t 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 bit dot lu slash oh, oh it's bitly. No, oh, okay. It's a, it's a All right, okay. okay. Uh three T P T I P I N capital J. Oop. It should work. Oh gosh, I put two periods in like ah. No, I don't want the dictionary. <laughs> Oh, I am a professional, ladies and gentlemen. Select all, copy, paste. Oh, come on. Three T I capital. Uh, oh, maybe that's lowercase L. Though. Thanks, Bitly. My goodness, T L. Hey, okay, all right, and now presenter view. And now I take this and I pull it over. Is it going? And then I maximize it. And then I make sure that you can see your presenter window. <sighs> this is why we have extra time built into the schedule dictionary. Presenter view. Make sure this is working. All right. Yay. All right. OK, so now the 20 minutes starts. Thank you. Oh, I can do this. Now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is that you can? I mean, yeah. Here we can make. Uh, it I'll, I'll try. Sure. All right. Thank you. Apologies for this small little. Also, I feel really short, Lydia. I can. I. I feel you here up here. Um. So thank you. My name's Erin Griffith. I'm the Fedora Program Manager. Um. I'm here today with um, my colleague uh, Stefano Cuso, and um, unfortunately our third co-presenter Tom Rebell from um, Oxford was unable to make it and unable to submit his recorded presentation, but we have um, a piece from him to share about 
their use. So we're here today to generally talk, give a quick overview of the Oxford Common File Layout specification. And then we're going to talk about how um, each of us are kind of implementing and using that specification within our software and in our institutions. So for anybody that is maybe unfamiliar or hasn't heard too much about it, the Oxford Common File Layout is a specification that describes an application independent approach to the storage of digital information in a structured, transparent, and predictable manner. So it was developed to provide a standardized approach to file system layout within digital repositories that would also promote preservation and support long-term object management best practices within these repositories. So it's defined and um, developed by an editorial board who are responsible for the upkeep, continued development, and maintenance of the specification. Um, currently, there are several implementations of the spec in active use around the world, all of which can be found on the OCFL website if anybody wants more info at ocfl.io. Today, though, we're just going to share with you our individual use cases involving OCFL and talk about why we opted to use it, how we're doing that, um, and uh, kind of the benefits that we're seeing from that. So if you do have any questions about the specs specifically, um, uh, Stefano and I aren't exactly the experts in OCFL. We will try our best to answer, but I will defer to the experts at, um, you know, on the editorial board. There is an OCFL channel on the code or an OCFL channel on the Slack, uh, Code for Lib Slack. So you can go there to find them. And I would encourage you to go if you have any additional questions that we can't answer. So as I mentioned, the purpose of OCFL is to provide an application independent approach to um, storing digital content. Um, the specification dictates the way that files are structured and written. And this, in terms of digital preservation, offers several benefits. These are kind of the five main benefits that the editors um, like to share. So the first one is parsability. So this means that the files themselves, once written to OCFL, are done so in a very simple, plain text format, which is readable to both machines and humans. So that means that they can be understood in the absence of the software that maybe created or wrote the original files. Um, the next one is robustness. So OCFL offers uh, checksums for both the content and its metadata to ensure that it is robust against errors, data corruption, um, especially between storage technologies. So OCFL also offers native versioning, and this is really the core of OCFL's DNA. It uses a forward delta algorithm, which eliminates unnecessary duplication between versions, so it's only going to take the changes to the most recent version and, and make the copy. Um, built into the specification is also the principle of immutable versioning, so everything is there and it exists as versions to allow their history to persist, thus building this kind of um, history of the items. And as I mentioned before, uh, by nature, OCFL allows for storage diversity, so you can use any type of storage system that you'd like. Because of the simple file system metaphor with its basic files and directories, it allows you to operate either on disk or in the cloud, whichever is uh, you know, beneficial for you. And lastly, OCFL offers completeness. So what this means is that everything is preserved in the structure of the specification, including all data and all the associated provenance, which allows you to theoretically rebuild your repository from the files that you have. So should the unspeakable ever happen, your hardware fails maybe, you can simply take the files that are written to OCFL and stand up your repository again from those items that you have. So as you can see, there is lots um, to gain from implementing OCFL. Um, and now we're just going to talk a little bit about why each of our programs and institutions have chosen to incorporate this standard. So I'm going to go first for Fedora. So at Fedora, we use the OCFL Java implementation of the specification. Fedora is written in um, um, is written in Java. Sorry, so we use the Java implementation. Um, we and we did this um, as a major feature improvement in our newest version, which is Fedora six. So the community made the, the decision to incorporate OCFL as a standard within our persistence layer um, in order to give our users back the transparency um, that they wanted and were used to with um, something like Fedora 3. So Fedora 4 used a mode shape backend, which um, was kind of this black box of unknowns. So uh, it wasn't conducive to a lot of use cases, and our users wanted this transparency back. So by incorporating OCFL, we had to do a major rewrite of the back end of the software, but now we have this very transparent and largely enhanced long-term digital preservation tool by offering the combination of Fedora 6 and OCFL. 
So Fedora benefits from using OCFL for preservation for several reasons. Fedora itself provides the means of reading, writing, and delivering the digital files to the users. And OCFL provides a standard for which those files are preserved. So it tells us what to, how to write it, and then Fedora offers the way to do that. So if we think about long-term preservation, if Fedora were ever to go away, because you have all, the, all of the data in an OCFL format, um, you know, if it were to ever go away and you don't have Fedora anymore, you can just take your repository and, and, and stand it up again using the files that you have written in OCFL. So everything is there. The metadata is still intact. Um, all the, you know, relationships that you've built and all the complex structures that you have are all written into the, directly into the OCFL. So it will reappear as you had it once before. And because of the standardized way that OCFL dictates the file system layout, migrations should be more simplified in the future. So there will there should be no need to reformat data moving from major versions of the software or moving through um, through updates and things like that. Um, OCFL will update along with uh, with Fedora. So uh, hopefully that makes things a little easier for for future migrations. And OCFL and Fedora provides preservation that is also independent of the storage medium. So again, um, this gives Fedora users more options for storing their objects for how they want to manage the repositories. Um, the OCFL makes those um, plain file, plain text files, and you can use whatever storage medium you need to do that. Um, there is native support in Fedora to, with the Java client for cloud storage, um, so that's another option. But essentially, to sum it all up, the standard dictates what to do, and the combination of Fedora and OCFL provides the kind of how to do it. And it's this combination of the application and the standard that provides really the best possible software solution for long-term digital preservation in our perspective. And uh, OCFL is the bedrock, I would say, or rather the, the storage fabric, how we like to call it, of uh, Harvard's uh, re institutional repository, the DRS, uh, on which I'm going to spend uh, a few words on. Um, so the DRS is the, the central repository for the Harvard Library, uh, LTS, the, the Library Technology Systems Services, sorry. Uh, and it contains about 10 million objects and, uh, well, depends on who you ask. It could be between 100 and 800 million files. I haven't got it <laughs> quite, a, quite a scale yet. Uh, but uh, in total, we have about two petabytes of data uh, in a replicated storage. We have a Starfish system that has a policy replication, so you can actually uh, have different resources replicated in, with different, in different ways and in different uh, tiers. Um, and this is just the beginning because uh, we are also starting to talk about um, depositing uh, audio video materials and research data, which will grow the size of the repository exponentially. Um, the DRS has been around for about 22 years. So uh, it's, it has a dedicated team which uh, maintains it uh, currently. Uh, but of course, the concepts are, you know, 22 years old, so it's due for a complete uh, reimagining, redesign, and uh, rebuild uh, from scratch. Um, the first part of this uh, redesign was uh, migrating all the storage layer or the storage fabric to uh, OCFL. So we uh, took all the, you know, the POSIX storage and we moved it to um, OCFL. And that uh, took about a year to do, or maybe even more. So we don't want to do that again. Um, now we are, uh, that's actually my phone. <laughs> 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 now um, uh, we want to uh, uh, re redesign the, um, uh, the software layer. Um, so we have this uh, DRS Futures project of uh, which team I'm, I'm part of. Uh, and it's a three year uh, capital funded project uh, to replace the service layer. Um, without ideally um, moving the data again. Um, how are we going to do it and how does OCFL play into this uh, scenario? So the approach uh, to our, uh, and just to, um, to be clear, we are in the, in the middle of the first phase, which is an exploratory phase. We are imagining an ideal uh, repository. So we are uh, gathering uh, requirements still. So we are imagining something that's unbounded by uh, time or budget uh, and, and stuff like that. Uh, but the, the overall uh, 10,000 foot uh, view would be to have, uh, to maintain the storage fabric uh, untouched and separated from the uh, application layer and replace the current DRS uh, 
software part without rearranging uh, the data in, in, the, in the storage. Uh, the assumptions we, we are making about this is that we have a standard available that's adopted by a sufficiently large and diverse community that uh, guarantees the stability that OCFL does. So if we were just us establishing a standard uh, we, you know, for as big as Harvard is, we probably wouldn't have enough uh, use cases to say this is a very comprehensive plan. You know, this is a very comprehensive layout that uh, could really um, encompass all possible use cases for the future. Um, and also have a, a community that's made out of uh, implementers and service providers that actually write software and maintain the required tools to implement that uh, this specification. So that's what uh, OCFL gives us. Uh, they have, uh, you know, OCFL constitute, um, makes up, uh, sorry. OCFL is a uh, file layout standard that is specifically designed for digital preservation, which we are mostly interested in. Uh, it's a software agnostic data layer. Uh, and also provides a community uh, that uh, is dedicated to resolving the problems that we are dealing with, uh, namely uh, digital preservation. I kind of like to draw a comparison with a IIIF model where you have like a body which is more or less formally defined that uh, maintains a specification and also fosters a community of uh, software developers and, uh, and technologists and service providers who enable the implementation of this uh, specification. Um, of course, not everything is perfect. We have our questions, our challenges, our doubts, uh, and uh, um, some of these questions I don't really have a clear answer for. Uh, and you know, this is actually a, an opportunity for more dialogue and development and improvement of, of OCFL. Uh, so one of the questions is, uh, since OCFL spreads everything out in files, how do we guarantee performance of a very large uh, repository? Um, how would we maintain backward compatibility? Because even if uh, OCFL is being well thought through and it's been thought for as many use cases as possible, it's probably likely to change at least a little bit in the future because there will be something that will change. So how do we uh, deal with those changes in the data layout? And uh, how does OCFL guarantee that who has petabytes or over petabytes of data don't have to uh, move them. Um, and also, do we have enough OCFL compatible software choices? Uh, one of the uh, challenges we have, uh, as I said, we aren't um, shopping yet for uh, solutions. Uh, we might, we don't know yet if we're going to uh, go with a, a vended system or an uh, open source system or an in-house built system. But uh, talking with some vendors, they say instead, Oh, we uh, support the CFL, but you will have to move the, the whole repository again. We said, no, you have to <laughs> be able to uh, put the software on top of our layer and it should work without moving our data. So uh, the choices will be restricted, will, will be narrower, and that's a trade-off. Uh, but also the advantage of being part of the OCFL community is that we don't have to sort out all these problems ourselves. And want to take this? Yes, so I'm going to, we have uh, Tom's portion here. Um, so apologies if this sounds reedy, but it, it is. Um, so, <laughs> so the Bodleian Libraries is the library service supporting the work uh, at the University of Oxford. Since 1602, it has grown to a collection of more than 13 million printed items. Um, Aura, or Oxford University Research Archive, is the IR for the University of Oxford. Oxford. We're a permanent and open archive of research materials produced by members of the University of Oxford. This includes articles, conference papers, theses, research data, work papers, posters, and more. They hold over 300,000 works over, and over 100,000 of these have public binary files. For many of these works, Aura holds the only digital copy. So the mission is not just to make these works available without a paywall or subscription today, um, but as far into the future as they can to develop ways to make today's digital content as available um, in 400 years um, as the books of the 17th century are today. So toward, the, uh, toward this end, the Bodleian Libraries is developing an advanced set of digital preservation microservices, or DPMS, which aims to monitor and support the preservation of binary content and metadata. For example, fixity, version checking, virus scanning, as well as the as well as establishing digital preservation best practices. So this does go beyond fixity into questions like how many PDFs do you hold that are image only, or what binary files do you hold um, that do not have supported reads uh, readers. 
Alongside this, we are building a digital preservation service or DPS, which will preserve a versioned copy of a digital object, which will allow the DPMS to monitor, analyze, and support the system. So in the first instance, the DPS will support the Aura platform, but they hope to roll the service out across the Bodleian's <coughs> digital services as a whole. So advantages for them um, in using OCFL. So using OCFL for the DPS gives us several major benefits, and a lot of these tie back to the five major benefits of OCFL. So it's platform and application agnostic. Multiple systems can update and manage the OCFL layer if necessary. They plan to use Fedora 6 and the OCFL Java implementation to manage the API layer, but to use the off-the-shelf Python and Go tools to index and validate the objects. In the future, we can use any OCFL-aware application to replace Fedora 6 and or the OCFL Java. The DPS OCFL Java layer can replace content migrations. Instead of migrating content every time, we update a management system. We can simply import content into the management system as required. It can be backed up and monitored on a system level and optimized using conventional file system management systems. System can be rebuilt entirely from a file system copy. And the structure of OCFL layer is clearly documented and human readable. All object metadata and binary files are stored in a single parent directory, which can be predictably located on the file system from the object's UUID. This means we don't need to index or manage, they don't need an index or management application to find or analyze any given object. It provides object level versioning because OCFL allows us to retrieve the state of any object at any point in time. We can use object metadata to designate given timestamps as semantic versions. And the advantages that they are seeing by uh, with Fedora 6. So Fedora 6 obviously has a well-documented RESTful API layer that they can use to manipulate objects and their versions using HTTPS. They can loosely couple the DPS and the services that it uses. They can use the API layer for all CRUD-related actions, including individual object components, such as binary files, modification of existing objects, and access to point-in-time versions. And it is independent of Aura's business logic or operational system needs. A different service, say our sister project, Digital Bodleian, which has a completely different software stack, can still use the API to manage their content. And then they are also seeing uh, benefits in transaction man management. Objects being updated are locked against further updates. Transactions can be rolled back, which is especially useful where large files are being ingested. They have an auth authentication and authorization system. And then they get all of the above kind of out of the box with Fedora 6 and OCFL. Um, and he, he notes that while optimal uh, configuration has been a challenge, they're able to store a range of 300,000 objects with the largest single object being about 500 gigabytes in size in a reliable and performant way. They've not yet tested with anything larger without writing their own code to do so. But uh, you know, they, they also gain the community and the, the resources that exist within the Fedora community. So up next for them, uh, they just completed a suite of performance and configuration testing on the Fedora 6 and OCFL system, and then they want to export Aura into the DPS and integrate it with their day-to-day -day operations, and then they hope to expand the DPS into other services within the Bodleian in, uh, in the future. Squeaked it in there. And so these are just some resources. The slides, I did upload them to the, uh, to the repo for... Uh, for access, but that's uh, from us. And if you have any questions for Tom, he encourages you to reach out and apologies uh, for not being able to be here. We don't have time for questions now. I didn't think so. <laughs> uh, yes, find, find them afterwards. Thank you very much. All right. Now, let's see. I got to do the thing where I do the thing. And I'm going to cuss and that kind of stuff. All right. <clears throat> All right. Uh, okay. Up next, we have Kate Dibel, going beyond better than nothing accessibility and archives. Uh, Kate, do you want your thing on presenter notes or? Uh, presenter notes would be awesome. All right. Whatever works. Okay. Which one is your, is your time? I have a PowerPoint. You have a PowerPoint? Wow. Old school. All right. Let's see. <laughs> Um, power. No, it's more accessible than Google Slides. Well, also that. <laughs> All right. Um, ah, yes, I would like, yes, open. Thank you. And let me just make sure, is the magic going to work? If I do slideshow, slideshow, presenter view, hey. All right, that's something I do like about PowerPoint is that presenter mode just works. All right, uh, Kate has a 20-minute talk. Uh, Timekeeper is over here. 
Um, and yeah, thank you. Go take it away, Kate. Uh, okay, good. We have the volume at all because I would hate to be using the microphone poorly. That you could really laugh at me. In case I didn't hit enter, if anyone can snag a picture of me, you'd be really make my boss really, really happy. So just send it to me on Slack. So yeah, going be going beyond better than nothing. Accessibility and archives. Yeah, it's code for lib. Kate's going to talk about accessibility. What a shock. I will say, though, Lydia gave such an awesome keynote this morning, so I'm hoping that I'm going to add to what she said. So really, this is one of the most common questions I get. I've been working in libraries now for 10 years, and since I'm known for talking about accessibility, archives comes up all the time. It's like, how do you make archives accessible? And I'm like, um, can you look over there for a little bit while I run away? Because that's a big question. But really, there are a lot of amazing challenges for library accessibility with archives. We have all these questions about digitization, multiple file formats, limited standards. And by that, I mean both metadata standards, accessibility standards, you name a standard, there's another standard that we can probably bring into archives. And then when you're talking about what I focus on, which is largely print disability and print access, you have all sorts of other issues uh, to think about. And really, it just, we have so much text, so much. I mean, I tend to make the joke that uh, humans have been creating content for millennia. The creators keep refusing to pause and let archives catch up. I keep asking, they always say no. I mean, NaNoWriMo, I'm like online going like, please, no, please. And nope. Although there are a few who like the excuse, like, well, I can't do NaNoWriMo now. You know, I can't get all my words out because, well, Kate asked me to not write. And really, we could blame it all on the Sumerians. They started writing things down first without any consideration of standards. But let's face it, even if they had, we'd be talking nowadays about, man, Uruk code identifiers are so limited. And really, have you looked at the spec for the Indus River link data? I mean... I think the specification is written in a language, but I'm not 100% certain. I think it's trying to convey something, but is it really a language? And that's the archaeology joke for the day. <laughs> if you need me to explain it there. But today's talk, I kind of, because I've been asked this a lot, I, I love accessibility work, particularly print access. I did a dissertation on it, so hopefully I did like it. Uh, and conversations on archives are end up being really exhausting and aggravating for, to me. And they usually get me kind of emotionally pent up. And I kind of only recently figured out why. It's about the disability perspective. So I, you're going to be noticing a lot of quotes in this. Disability is not a tragedy. Disability only becomes a tragedy when society fails to provide the things needed to lead one's daily life. Uh, Judy Human. Here's the thing. I am disabled. I am part of the disability community, and we share our struggles and our triumphs. I've been working in disability now for 20 years, and it took a couple of years into it when I started looking at dyslexia. I started working with a student disability group. I was a grad student, and I had not recognized the fact that I, had, that I was disabled at the time. At the time, I was dealing with depression and particularly what we thought was social anxiety. And I could not manage networking at conferences. This was 20 years ago. I've had to work on this a lot. So it's big progress. But if you put me in a cocktail party, you wouldn't immediately know who I was because I'd be trying to climb the walls for air. That's how panicky I was. And so I finally realized, hey, that's actually preventing me from networking as a grad student and getting internships and future career. So I recognized I had a disability. And over the years, things have changed. Uh, ended up realizing one's in social anxiety per se. It was actually, oh, you're an undiagnosed uh, autistic person. And I've worked on that a lot. It's, if you knew me 10 years ago, you would consider me to be a very different person. This is one of the few spaces where I feel 100% confident. I'm, I love talking, you know, giving talks in, in this. You know, talking uh, casual, that's where you see me get a lot more quiet. And really, because of this, I am, I am a member of several disability groups. Uh, I'm a member of an IT group uh, for people with disabilities. If you're curious about this, um, 
reach out to me. I can talk with you about it. We'd probably like you there. And we share a lot of like the things we struggle with. And today kind of, I'm not going to give you the end all topic on how to make archives accessible. Yeah, you know, installing an overlay will not do it. There is not a Python package or Ruby gem. Yeah, it's not that simple, but I wanted to give you the perspective from the disability side on this and kind of understand where like some of the emotional reactions I get are. And with this in mind, uh, just in case if you want to know more about archives, actually almost exactly a year ago today, I gave a talk to the uh, Digital Library of Georgia on digital libraries, repositories, and making them accessible. So I have a link to it there. The slides are up in the uh, OSF repository now. So feel free to take a look at it. This gets a little more technical. But I also want to give a preemptive apology. If you feel uncomfortable called out or that I'm referring specifically to you in regards to a conversation, I am sorry. I'm trying to do my best to anonymize this and divorce this from that. But also, I have to thank you. By challenging me, by making me have these difficult conversations, I get better at being an advocate. And it's really, it's learning for both of us. So let's talk about this. You know, content is only one part of an online repository. The repository itself needs to be considered. You know, it's a lot like a physical library building. And we've seen great examples. Uh, Lydia went ahead and pointed out the horrible library on Long Island, which honestly I use, uh, I talk about that all the time. But really, can the disabled user get to it? And there's actually a great quote that I learned years ago in web accessibility, or just in actually accessibility in higher and education in general. There's no point in building a state-of-the-art accessible classroom on the third floor of a school building with no elevator. And it really helps if it's said with a strong Texas accent, because that's actually how I first said it, and it just really sticks with you more. But that's the fact. If you cannot get to your accessible content, you've not made it accessible. You still have to get there. And so I'm just going to rant for a brief moment here, more so than normal. For the love of my, just follow the web content accessibility guidelines. We have had them for over 20 years now. Just do it. I mean, they're a baseline of accessibility. If you meet that, you're doing okay. I mean, you can do a lot better than just WCAG 2.1 AA. Heck, I'd be happy if you're doing level A. And by the way, it's the law for Section 508. And if you're in Ontario, it's really big, the law. You know, the AODA uh, is a recent legislation that has made a lot of companies panic. So, like, yeah, particularly during uh, the pandemic, if you were in accessibility, you were hoping that you could actually uh, move up to Canada because, God, they were hiring like mad. But let's take a scenario here. Let's, let's consider that you actually have a mobility issue. I'm not saying you're necessarily in a wheelchair, so let's make it something that's actually quite feasible for a lot of you. I mean, putting yourself in a wheelchair might be too much of a stretch for your imagination, but most of us, we've sprained an ankle or have been on crutches for some reason. And you want to go to a restaurant, but the front entrance has stairs. So this was like newcomer dinner last night. And you're told like, well, okay, I can't navigate the stairs. They're like, oh, we have an accessible entrance. And they direct you to the accessible entrance. You go down a block, you enter a dimly lit alleyway, you walk past several dumpsters, uh, and then you knock on the kitchen door. It'll eventually get answer answered. They'll let you in, but they might have to have you wait to get through and get into the restaurant. And don't ask about the access for the bathroom. Do you feel welcome? I mean, you... St do you? I mean, well, you still get to eat, right? You still get to enjoy the restaurant. I mean, you know, it's also, it's kind of equivalent to like, you know, I'm not going to whip you 10 times. I'm only going to whip you six times. You know, is that really an improvement? I, I'm being a little crude here, but this is the whole notion of separate but equal. It is just, it's exhausting. And this is actually a very common disability experience. Right there was our catch 22. Because the country was so inaccessible, dis the disabled people had a hard time getting out and doing things, which made us invisible. So we were easy to discount and ignore. 
And until institutions were forced to accommodate us, we would remain locked out and invisible. And as long as we were locked out and invisible, no one would see our true force and would dismiss us. Duty human. It's, that's a big thing. It's about being able to get present. That's a lot of the discipline. Can you actually make it there? And this relates to another common uh, uh, metaphor that's used by a lot of people with disabilities. It's called spoon theory. Out of curiosity, who here has heard of spoon theory? I'm loving that this is becoming more popular. It's a metaphor for the fact of that when you have a disability, you spend a lot of energy managing it. I have an autoimmune issue, and it's something I've been dealing with more and more the last couple of years. And it's just questions like, what are the things that you actually can get done in a day? And the idea is pretty simple. It's like, you know, think about like your kitchen. You have a limited number of spoons or it could be a limited number of socks. It's just a metaphor. And every activity you do takes up a certain number of spoons. And the only way you get a spoon back after it's used is if you do a wash, you sleep. And you, so you only have so many spoons left. You can go like, well, I really want to do game night tomorrow, but well, I have enough spoons to actually be able to stay up and play a game and be social. So I'm going to be trying to conserve some spoons for that tomorrow, personally. So it's very, very popular. And it's just sort of a nomenclature where it's like, oh, man, I wish I could loan you a few spoons right now. But I really, you know, I, I have soup and I only have forks left. You know, it, we do all sorts of jokes like that. And this actually is useful for talking about OCR. So the fun of OCR, we know OCR works, right? It's perfect. No, it don't, it's not. We know it's not perfect. Although, honestly, if you talk to AI experts, they call OCR a solved problem. Yeah, I, I just... Every, that's a legitimate argument for strangling someone, if you ask me. But is it good enough for accessibility? And for accommodation work, which I've done a lot of, OCR alone is not enough. You often need to do a human verification and correct for any translation errors. But what percent of, uh, of OCR accuracy is enough? We talked about that accuracy incorrectly. Let's face it, for libraries, we are largely about search. And OCR has improved search dramatically. We're not relying upon keywords only. Being able to do, you know, just doing a rough OCR of a journal's collection of articles enables you to find way more articles or ones that use a particular term that might not actually appear anywhere in like the abstract or the metadata. That's very valuable. And so even if that's 80% accurate, you're gaining a lot. But when you're talking about reading and you're talking about comprehension and you're talking, particularly academic libraries, we're talking about reading to learn, you need a lot more accuracy. So really, what is the spoon cost when key vocabulary words and technical terms are in an error, say, for a reader with dyslexia, when OCR messes up? So let's think about it. What are the spoon costs for print access? Well, first of all, you have to request the accommodations, which is, you know, and get approved for that, which can be so much fun. And you often have to do this every year because, well, yes, dyslexia is a lifelong condition that you cannot be cured of. But we need to make sure that you still have it every year. Same thing for your paralysis and, you know, oh, yeah, you weren't born with a leg. We need to make sure that you don't have a leg this year. You know, no miracle. It can be that ridiculous at times. You have to wait for the actual text remediation, which is complicated. Then you have to convert the file for your own reading technology. Then you might have to deal with poor formatting, so misuse of a standard, things like uh, Lydia showed running headers and footers, reading order mistakes. And then even if you get through all that, then as you're trying to listen to it or parse it, it's like, what is this word here? This is a critical vocabulary word, and I don't know what it means. Or if it's a piece of fiction, if there's like any specialized dialogue, you know, jargon, you know, if you read a fantasy book, how much of that is something OCR is going to naturally find? But Kate, AI will certainly get better, right? I'm going to say that's an ableist statement. You're telling disabled people, first of all, to even to wait for better access. So it's like more waiting, more of those experience. Are you sure it will get better? I mean, really, how much of improvements have you seen over time? When it comes to your digital archives, when are you going to rerun 
OCR on them. When have you done that? Have you actually rerun OCR thinking that it'll be better this time? Some journals have done this. I know Psychology Review has done this because I've had to, I have a lot of my doctoral work involved dealing with the psych, psych, Psychology Review, and I can tell you things have definitely improved. They also rescan things. And that's an excellent question. Are you going to do better quality scans? So an example of this is Hathi Trust. They are awesome. They do a lot of accessibility outreach. But when I was at Syracuse University doing a lot of remediation of library materials, I hated getting materials from them because a lot of times the scans were very poor quality. And I ran OCR on it. I would have to do so many manual fixes. I would rather us do our own scanning in-house most of the time than deal with a Hathi Trust. That was just one of the things that I often dealt with. And what we really need with OCR is, and this is something that if you actually want to work on this as a coder, we need a lot of user experience love. We need better fine tuning and training for unique inputs. Let's make it easy for us to say, here's a unique font. Let's train it on this and use it for this particular scan. More usability studies of the editing tools. Abby Fine Reader is a very powerful tool, but I, it's a pain to like be able to automate a lot of things in it. And, and two, it's like one of those like AI should assist us, but it should not be the only thing. It should be an assistant. It should be working with us. It should not be like, oh, we plug it and assume it work does perfectly. You know, basic idea there. And, you know, some other things too, if you actually want to do OCR, what do you have to do? Here, we have to think about like, this is the standard policy usually. You do a spot check of the first X pages and a random sample. So like the first 10 pages and 5% of the rest. If the errors are minor, you accept it as is. Otherwise, you do manual remediation. But Kate, we don't have the budget to manually remediate everything. We have so much. Is it just a basic pass of OCR better than nothing? Doing nothing is the worst, but you can't stop at the first step. Disabled people have been hearing this all their lives. Change is coming. We're working on it. Just be patient. It takes a while for change to happen. Here's the thing. I actually love Michigan State Libraries. They have this great statement on their website. Although the MSU libraries strive to collect, acquire, and develop accessible digital electronic collection, unfortunately, not all are. The MSU libraries are able to provide remediated accessible versions. This is a great statement. It's saying like, hey, we can't make everything out of the box accessible, but we will work with you on it. And that's the big thing. Do not stop at OCR. Develop an accommodation by request service budget for this, even if you have to use a third-party service. Upload remediated versions. Whenever you make one, put it up there. This way then things slowly improve and make sure that it's discoverable or it's like going, hey, this is a better quality, more accessible version. And at the end of the year, if you have some budget money left over, target some popular collections. And speaking of budgets, you should actually be doing a line item for accessibility in on, for any archive project. Pay for quality OCR. Pay for people to review the OCR results. Budget for future remediations. And if you don't want to listen to me, I'm going to turn to Dre. And, and Dre said this earlier today. No one asked, say, about fire stairs. They're just part of the budget. Make that part of the standard there. So yeah, listen to Dre, not me. <laughs> but really... <laughs> But really, a lot of this, too, is about nothing about us without us. This is a disability saying. And it's another way of saying this. Do it with us, not for us. Talk with us. Reach out to it. Develop a disability advocacy patron group. Use them for feedback on access issues. You know, ask, ask for their help on what to remediate. And it might take a while to do this, but you'll be able to build it up. I'm going to tell you something, too. There are going to be jerks out there. Disabled people are not saints. I'm certainly a uh, beep at times. But so, and some will demand perfect access yesterday, but um, the majority of us will work with you. We will understand. We just want you to see you try. Change never happens at the pace we think it should. It happens over years of joining together. But seemingly out of the blue, something will tip. Judy Human. Judy Human, who I've been quoting, recently passed away. She was the mother of the disability rights movement. Really influential person. So that's kind of where my thoughts are. If you have questions, reach out to me if you need to. Admire Fiona looking silly. And because that I'm probably completely out of time. So
All right. Thank you, Kate. <clears throat> now let's see what the next thing is. The next one is a recorded talk, if I'm recalling right. Let me find my notes because, of course, Macintosh. Oh, don't tell. Oh. Don't do this thing to me, Macintosh. All right. I'm going to have to go over here. Sorry, recorded people who are waiting for this silliness. Come on. Don't do the thing. Window. Who invented, no, not that one. Who invented Macintoshes? Where is, why? Is it, is it this? Why did you move the desktops if the things are on? Oh, is it, where? Oh, okay. Now it's, now it's on this desktop. All right. I am the reason the conference is late now. Okay. Our next talk is a recorded talk, 15 minutes, but timekeeper not required because it's recorded. Jessica Edwards, Building Effective Library Dashboards in Tableau. All right, recorded people, take it away. Is it, does anyone know how the recorded talks are working? <laughs> are they on here? Outlook. All right, I'm standing by. Oh, computer switch. We'll, we'll see if this really works. Another Mac, of course. Kate, do you have a name for this? I don't see that. Found it. Cool. Can. I can't stop it. So now do I have to move it over? Okay. Hello, and welcome to Building Effective Library Dashboards in Tableau. My name is Jessica Edwards, and I am a Collections Analysis Librarian at Columbia University Libraries in New York. And the plan today is to talk about some basic development and design structures of Tableau dashboards and some of the challenges you may encounter. So a little bit about me. I am a Collections Analysis Librarian, like I said. 
Um, and based on my title, you can and figure out that my primary role is to analyze our collections, which resources are or are not being used, who's using them and how they're being used, what gaps we might have in our collections, that kind of thing. And this analysis can take a variety of different forms, but my favorite way to present any findings is in Tableau, via dashboard, sometimes visualizations, just anything I can do in there. Um, prior to this role, I worked at the Montana State Library, which is a government agency in Montana. And in my role as data coordinator there, I became a heavy Tableau user and really loved the way it could be adapted to present data to an audience. Um, a lot of library-focused data, but some other data as well. And I just really enjoyed using it for that kind of thing. And just a quick note here, while I am focusing more on Tableau throughout this, um, it's just because it's what I use. You might have access to something like Power BI or QuickSense or something else, and I think a lot of the same concepts apply there. So, why dashboards? Um, I am somebody who loves working in spreadsheets. I love them. They make sense to me. The data makes sense to me. They're great. But they're not always the best way to share and present your data. Your audience might not have the same enthusiasm for spreadsheets that you do, unfortunately. Um, looking through them might just take more time than they have. Um, and you really kind of want to grab your audience and really, um, you know, get your point across, show your value, tell your story. So there's plenty of cases where you could synthesize your findings into a written report, which is also great. Um, sometimes you can put visualizations in there, but that's not always the best for the audience either. Um, using a dashboard can allow for more interactivity. It can help them just kind of engage more with the data, more with your findings. Um, it might make more sense to present things in a dashboard if, say, it needs to be updated regularly. If you're doing monthly data pulls of counter reports or usage data, updating that every month, you can kind of work that into your workflow with a dashboard rather than writing a new report, appending more text to a report, that kind of thing. It might just make more sense to do a dashboard method, make it more meaningful to your audience. It can help um, really give others the tools they need to make meaningful decisions with that data. It makes it a little bit more understandable and just kind of um, has more engagement, I find. So gathering the data, obviously, in order to build an effective dashboard, you need to have data behind it. So no matter how you're getting your data and what format it's in, consistency and documentation are key. Um, if you do a manual data pool every month or every quarter, um, you're really going to want to document the process somewhere for yourself or for others. You may think, I'm doing this every month, I can remember it, and you probably will most of the time, but sometimes you make little tweaks, little changes, um, and that really impact your data in a big way, and you might not remember it the next month, or you might just be out, um, and somebody else might have to be doing it for you, or you might get an employee who can help you with it, and you can just hand them the documentation and have them be ready to go forward. Um, it just really is a helpful thing to do. And I'm not really going to go over cleaning and shaping data in great detail here, but just keep in mind that this entire process does take time. There's a lot of invisible work that goes into building dashboards and generating visualizations, and you're going to want to make sure you account for the data shaping process when planning out your dashboard. Um, the data just doesn't appear. We can get the data, but then you need to modify it to make it work in Tableau. You need to clean it. You need to verify it. There's just a lot else that goes into it, and you really want to kind of budget that time into any dashboard building. And also, um, make sure others are aware. Make sure others understand that, you know, we can do this, but it will take time. There's a little bit more behind the scenes that they might be aware of. Um, if you're able to automate some of your data preparation, do it, absolutely. It's really great to automate what you can. If you have a tool like Tableau Prep, um, which I believe you have if you have Tableau Desktop, um, it can be really great for automating some of the data shaping that you'll need to do on a regular basis. For example, if you do manual counter data pools every month to get new reports, you can create a flow in Prep to shape the data into a Tableau-friendly format. So you're getting these reports of usage from the vendor. They're standardized already, but then to get them ingested properly in Tableau, you need to essentially pivot them. You can just create a flow in something like Prep and just upload the new data and just run it and have it output the way that you need to have it. 
um, and it can really make it easier for you to recreate those steps every month, make it just a little, a little quicker. So in order to build your dashboard as efficiently and effectively as possible, it's going to be best to lay out the framework for it before you start creating a dashboard just to create it can be fun. I've done it, um, but it can be a wasted exercise um, if in the end, nobody's using it. You're making this great product and it's just kind of sitting there unused. So you're going to want to ask some important questions before you get started. So try to figure out what you're trying to answer with this dashboard. Do you have a specific problem or question in mind? Um, what is the organization or the working group or department looking to learn through this? Are there things that keep coming up in meetings that you kind of want to dig into and this is meant to help with that? So having a question like this in mind will help guide you as you put the pieces of your dashboard all together. You also want to think of the ideal outcome, kind of what would this answer again, but what would it look like? Who would use it? How often would it be getting used? All these things you kind of want to at least have some ideas of before you get started. Otherwise you're gonna be doing work, undoing it, deleting stuff, redoing stuff, tweaking stuff, which you're gonna do anyways, but stuff like this, if you can think of it ahead of time, it'll save you time in the long run. And keep in mind that the questions are not static. Um, they're really a jumping off point to get you started. Sometimes they might stay same throughout the whole process, and that's great. But um, more often than not, I find that you start with a really simple question. And as you dig into the data and gather more and start kind of diving into it, the questions evolve and become more complex. Um, you might even find that there's other data sources you need to loop in to answer these questions. So some possible very basic questions are things like, what trends can we see in electronic versus print circulation? As one goes up, does the other go down? What percentage of affiliated authors are publishing in open access journals? Can we generate a forecast to try to predict ebook usage over the next quarter? And then what does it tell us from then? How many databases from a particular vendor are actually being used and how are they being used? So you're also going to want to consider your user and your audience. Who's this for? If it's internal to your organization, you know the exact people or groups who will be using it, great. You can tailor it to their needs. You might be able to assume a level of knowledge about the data. Um, if it's for a wider audience or for the general public, there may be more involved in making sure that you're fully explaining what you're putting out there. Um, something like a definitions page is a really good tool. Here I have one set up just for a very basic counter usage dashboard. Um, so if you're familiar with counter reports, you understand what these mean. If you're not familiar, even if you work in a library, you might not be familiar, you're going to want to refer to a definition page like this. And adding something like this to your dashboard can be really great for the user. If for whatever reason you don't have the space, you don't have whatever availability to make um, a tab or a page like this in your dashboard, um, I suggest putting a text box and linking out to it, um, referring them to a website where they can go for more information, just giving them the information that they need so they can get the full um, functionality of your dashboard. It's also important to think of how you can make this more user-friendly, um, trying to view the dashboard as a user rather than as the creator. So taking a step back and saying, okay, if I came into this knowing nothing, what would I get out of this? Um, and that can be really um, hard at times because we know the data and we know how Tableau or your software works. So trying to figure that out can be a little bit difficult. So sometimes you need to loop somebody else in and have them look at it and give you feedback about it. Um, you might want to define things that you might not think about defining, like I said before. Um, you might also want to think about how people interact with the dashboard. So if you're familiar with Tableau, there's a thing called tooltips. I think they're really great. So something like this donut chart, you could put a tooltip here. So if I hover over this platform A section, it then gives me more information, the total requests and the percentage. 
um, not all of your users will be familiar with this. They might not understand that if they hover and they have that interactive ability, they can get more out of the information that you're presenting. So you might want to do something like, um, instead of having this in a tooltip, have it on the actual visualization, have it static there on the screen so it's always there. Or you might want to kind of empower the users um, and give them more instructions. So have an instructions page similar to the definitions page or have a text box somewhere kind of highlighting what they can do and how they can click around and kind of guiding them a little bit. Another important thing is to keep in mind how you can make this more accessible. Um, Tableau is obviously a visual tool, but some users might be using screen readers to access your dashboard. Um, Tableau.com has articles with steps on how to make visualizations navigable using screen readers. There's other resources out there um, that might give you good tips on that. Consider also making your underlying data available via a downloadable spreadsheet that's been optimized for accessibility. So if you have this posted on a public page or an internal page, consider also um, adding a link where they can download the data. So the temptation may be to jump right in and create a bunch of graphs that all have interactive mo modes. It could be filtered using other graphs and all these great things. But again, you need to consider your users and your intent. Um, having too many things to look at or click through can distract from your primary goal, your primary message or story. And you want to kind of think about what you can start with at as a bare minimum to get your point across. So start from less and grow as needed. You don't want to confuse or overwhelm your users. Um, my go-to approach is to start big with the data and small with the visualizations. When I start, I want as much data as possible because it's really going to save me time later. Um, I don't have to go back and gather more data or connect more things. But with the visualizations, I wanna start pretty small and then see what they tell me and then add as I need to. You might prefer to wireframe or sketch out a model, um, even manually sketching out on paper um, before you get started. I tend to not do this. I jump right in and just start creating visualizations, um, but that's not always the best approach. Wireframing can be really helpful, especially if it's a bigger project or more people are involved. Um, when you're asking those initial questions, getting everybody on board, maybe you also want to wireframe or create a basic structure of this there. Um, it might be really beneficial before you start actually get going and creating anything. So preparing for roadblocks. Um, I think a big one is getting the data in the first place. This can be difficult. Maybe it takes a lot of time. Maybe if you have to go through a vendor, it takes time there. Um, it might be that you have to go through somebody else at your organization and it's going to be dependent on their availability and their workflow and their current workload. Um, it can be frustrating and I think you just have to kind of budget for extra time there. You might just have to wait a little bit for the data. You might have to kind of find a workaround to get it. It can also be hard to get everybody to decide on a specific question to answer or a direction to go in. You might find yourself creating a dashboard just to create one, and that's what the group wants. And unfortunately, you kind of just have to do that sometimes. Um, you can try to guide them, try to get them to figure out questions to answer, but sometimes you just kind of have to go with it and then hope that the questions come later. You might also not have the engagement or user adoption that you were hoping for. Um, and I think here it's really important to think of why this might be. Is the dashboard as user-friendly as it could be? Do you need to go back and do things like take away those tooltips and show the data on the screen. Maybe people don't quite want the level of interactivity that a dashboard offers, but they do want to see it. And think about how you can change things to make them a little bit easier for new users. Um, you might also have to alter the focus. Maybe you're not asking the right questions. Maybe you need to shift what you're looking at a little bit. Hopefully, um, if this is an internal group, you can have the opportunity to have a meeting to kind of walk through the dashboard. You can show users how to use it, and you can also ask questions and get feedback on why it might not be meeting their needs at this time. And sometimes it turns out that you don't need a dashboard after all. You put this work in, and it is not what was needed for the project. And that can be frustrating, and it's unfortunate when it happens, but it does happen. 
Um, you might still be able to salvage it. You can use some of the visualizations for written reports. Um, you can save the dashboard and revisit it in the future, or you can save it and use it kind of as a template. Maybe you made a really great dashboard. It doesn't work for this project, but you can open it again later and be like, ooh, this chart was really great. How can I make this work for this next project? And kind of use it as your own little inspiration. And just to wrap up, um, there's some really great resources out there. Tableau user groups are a great way to see what others are doing and get inspiration. There's a higher ed user group. Um, it doesn't particularly have a lot of librarians in it, as far as I can tell, but it's really great to kind of see some of the issues that other um, institutions might be facing when they when they create dashboards. And it seems to have some overlap with libraries. Um, Tableau Public is also a great resource to explore. I learned best by doing. When I first started using Tableau, I would look at some of the workbooks out there and download them and try to recreate them with my data. And that's how I learn. And it's really great if you work that way as well. It's also just good inspiration or to see how people are using similar data to you to get really great ideas. And of course, there's a ton of blogs and websites out there um, that can help guide you. Just something to keep in mind. It can be overwhelming and you kind of get sidetracked like, oh, I want to make this. I want to make that. And you just kind of have to rein yourself in sometimes if you're working on a particular project that needs a specific angle. So that is it. If you have any questions or would like to reach out to me, please feel free. My contact information is here and I hope you have a great rest of your conference. All right, thank you, um, person who is not here, uh, who cannot hear our questions and applause. Thank you. Um, and now, which, th this computer, of course, is logged, locked, and I can't read the notes anymore. Well, I don't need this. I just need to be able to see the notes, because I'm just going to read I, Okay, well, we need to get you off this computer and onto that computer. No, we don't need to get me onto this computer because the next talk is a Zoom talk and they're going to take care of it in the back. Oh, okay. I just need to be able to see the notes. Yeah, but we need to do that eventually. Yes, eventually anyway, yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay, our next talk via Zoom is Katie Amaral, Doug Simon. International Image Interoperability Framework, also known as IIIF, is that what they say? I forget, every time. Infrastructure Redesign at Harvard Library. It will be via Zoom. I have been told I don't need to do anything with the computers or the screens and it'll just happen. So, magic time.
I'm just going to stare perplexedly at this. I can hear it. We still can't hear you in the room. So we just... Yeah. Oh, in the Zoom meeting, I forgot about that. Let's see. Yeah, this thing is yeah, this thing is this computer on Zoom? Oh, wait. But this is, this guy this is muted. How about now? Hey. Katie, can you try talking? Yep. I'm talking now. Don't know if it's working. Hopefully it's working. Testing one, two, three. Anybody home? Testing one, two, three. Yes. Sorry, I got so excited I cheered and jumped off the stage and forgot to let you know that it worked. It's working. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. All right. Nice. Okay. Um, not sure exactly how much time I have, but let me see how quickly I can get through all these slides. So, uh, like I said, uh, my name is Katie Amaral. I'm a software engineer in Hollywood Library Technology Services, and I'm here with my colleague Doug, who is also a software engineer. Um, we're going to be doing a super high-level introduction. Yeah? Yeah, 15 minutes should be enough. Okay, sounds good. Um, so we'll be starting with a high-level introduction to OS, if you don't know what it is. Um, we'll do an introduction, and uh, we'll be going all the way down to a very detailed technical level. Um, so this will be interesting if you're brand new to IIIF um, or if you're very experienced. Um, so we do have some demos that Doug has recorded on our YouTube channel. Uh, this link is here. Um, I'll also be publishing these slides on the Code for Lib share site. So um, you can access those at this link and other links that will be shown here uh, at a later time. 
All right, so quick introduction to IIIF for those who don't know already. IIIF stands for International Image Interoperability Framework. And essentially, this is a set of open standards um, to provide API specifications that uh, standardize the description and delivery of digital objects on the web. Uh, so this is important because it allows uh, interoperability between institutions around the world. Um, so digital media can be served uh, from different environments um, and accessed and interacted with in a standard way with uh, standard viewers. Um, so this allows uh, librarians um, to and researchers alike to build collections from various sources um, and one uh, central um, viewer. Um, so again, this aligns uh, web standards aligns with web standards uh, to enable more advanced functionality uh, beyond just uh, what a regular uh, functionality of a web browser can provide um, with a triple F compliant viewer. Uh, so this includes uh, for images, uh, structure, um, like chapters and sections, navigation, page turn objects for page turn objects, uh, deep zoom, annotations, uh, with analysis and OCR, uh, comparison, and for audiovisual, this includes uh, captions, transcriptions, annotations, and more. Um, so quick overview of IIIF APIs. Uh, there's the image API, which returns an image in response to a standardized uh, HTTP request. Um, so you can request region, size, rotation, and the quality and format. And again, this is standardized across all IIIF image APIs. There's a presentation API, uh, which returns a manifest, uh, which is a JSON uh, document that describes the structure and presentation metadata for a digital object. We'll be taking a quick look at that as well. And the authentication API, we'll be taking a look at that later as well, um, which uh, provides specifications for uh, how to authenticate and authorize uh, users uh, across the IIIF uh, system. Uh, and then there's also the search API, which uh, provides standards for searching text within an object. So that's transcriptions, OCR, and so forth. And just real quick, OCR stands for optical character recognition. Um, so I'm going to quickly go over to my web browser, and I will be jumping around a little bit, and show um, this is a public, publicly accessible uh, digital object that we have on our IIIF site. Uh, it's a quick demo of the Mirador viewer. And as you can see, um, it has the deep zoom capability. So I can see this uh, book that was digitized in our library, and then I can do a deep zoom. Um, also, another um, uh, example of our viewer here, this is our uh, Harvard Library Mirador viewer. And uh, as you can see on the left here, um, we can navigate through this um, book, which is an atlas of maps. We can navigate through it with the uh, various sections here that were organized um, with this particular structure. And um, this is all powered by uh, IIIF Manifest. So if you go over here on the top right of the viewer and you click on IIIF Manifest, uh, in the back end, this is uh, where all these um, links uh, to these resources are. And this is how this all works. So this is just a quick demo of a page turned object. And I am going a little quickly here through this. So hopefully that's a good introduction for those who uh, were not previously familiar with IIIF. So now I'm going to get into uh, uh, specifically our implementation uh, at Harvard. Um, so at Harvard Library, we have over 55 million images uh, hosted on our IIIF infrastructure. And over 3 million of these are from our museum collections. So you can also find uh, Harvard Art Museum, for example, uh, online. They have uh, publicly accessible digital objects. Um, and there's some other examples here of um, just some counts of how many objects we have in our systems. Um, so now we're going to start going through um, what we did for our moder modernization project. And then we'll be getting into some more of the technical details. Um, so these are the milestones that we've completed. Uh, we modernized our uh, pre-existing IIIF infrastructure. So we implemented a uh, cantaloupe in image server. Uh, we have encoders for various uh, different uh, image formats, including JPEG, GIF, TIFF, PNGs. Uh, we use Cockadoo and OpenJPEG uh, for those. 
Uh, we also uh, modernized our uh, authorization layer and implemented the AAAF uh, auth specification. We'll get into more detail into that a little bit later. We also upgraded our presentation API to support manifest version three um, and enhanced our descriptive metadata support um, for our uh, metadata feeds um, and also improved uh, performance. Okay. Um, some other milestones that we completed uh, was that uh, our new IIIF infrastructure is now uh, generalized such that it uh, more easily supports multiple departments across the organization, uh, and we support a variety of use cases um, without being too specialized. Um, so those departments can easily integrate AAAF without having to spend time on AAAF specific implementation details. They can just plug into our system and focus on their specific needs for their own applications, and they don't have to worry about uh, AAAF specific details. Um, we also decoupled our asset delivery from the digital repository service. We'll be taking a look at that uh, in more detail as well. Um, and we also onboarded some new tenants, um, including academic technology and uh, VPAL, which is the um, online learning platform. So going through this a little quickly here. Um, so the technologies that we used are um, include uh, languages such as uh, Python and uh, JavaScript. Um, for our infrastructure, we use Docker and Ansible. And just as a side note, we are working on implementing uh, Kubernetes as well to help with our orchestration. Uh, for image server, we use Cantaloupe. Previously, we had used Loris, and now in the uh, modern modernized system, we're using Cantaloupe. And for databases, we use uh, Postgres, Mongo, and Redis. Um, for our technology evaluation, um, we um, evaluated our choices against these criteria, um, including performance, scalability, what libraries are available, how extensible it is, uh, our learning curve, community support, and documentation. Um, so uh, for Python, um, we found that it's uh, particularly useful for anything that requires computationally intensive processing. And uh, JavaScript, specifically Node.js, uh, for scalable and performant network applications, particular, particularly um, because it is built on uh, asynchronous I.O. Um, so our architecture principles uh, are separation of concerns, don't repeat yourself, single responsibility, and principle of least knowledge. And our architecture is based on a microservices design. So microservice is a modular service with a single responsibility. And that allows us to um, conform to separation of concerns, single responsibility, and principle of least knowledge. Um, so for some examples, our asset lookup is a single microservice responsible for lookups that translates a URL to a, uh, or requests URL to a IIIF URL format to find the image location. Um, we'll be getting into more details on this in a few minutes. So I'm just gonna continue along. Um, so recommendations for our microservices, just in general, if you're thinking about um, designing a microservice, uh, your architecture with microservices, uh, some recommendations are um, definitely established standards that can be used consistently. Uh, for example, in your Docker image, uh, in your Docker images, build a base image that can be reused. For example, we have a base image that we use for all of our node components. Um, also standardize uh, repeatable things like uh, network connection configurations and uh, logging and um, anything you can standardize, definitely do it from the start if possible. Uh, build a prototype project that can be used as a template. That's really helpful for not having to repeat uh, uh, your code. Uh, and publish modules and packages for sharing code across multiple components. Uh, also configuration management is really important. Um, to have a centralized uh, configuration management system um, and definitely commit all of your configurations and use con obviously use encryption for those stores secrets um, and automate the build and deployment pipelines. That's going to be huge in a microservices uh, model. Uh, so now I'm going to get into some of these uh, technical diagrams here. Uh, so the first one, I'm going to jump out of the slides for a moment. And... Um, 
so this first diagram shows how we've conceptualized uh, the categories of our uh, components. Uh, so we have uh, authentication and authorization. We have asset delivery and those various components there that handle the, the lookup and uh, getting the data from the database and caching layers and uh, storage. Um, and then we have um, our manifest service, uh, manifest services, uh, which include uh, the presentation server, our converters, validators, and other services that uh, support uh, manifests. Um, and we have, have, of course, the viewer, which is a Mirador view viewer. And uh, we have ingest, which is an entire ingest pipeline of microservices and an ingest API. And then, of course, there's the tenant, uh, which they have uh, their content and uh, they have their asset and manifest uh, metadata. Uh, so the next uh, diagram I'm going to get into here is our... One moment here. One categories. And then I have our asset ingest diagram here. One moment. Um, so I've got two different diagrams for our asset ingest. So the first diagram is very, very detailed. There is a detailed walkthrough in the demo video, uh, but I have a simplified version of that here, which I'll do a quick walkthrough in. I know I have a, just a couple minutes left. Um, so uh, our ingest process starts with the requester service providing uh, JSON, uh, which includes the assets and the manifest and a JOT token. Uh, that token is provided to the ingest API, and then it uses, it sends that token to our authorization API to verify the token, which is a centralized uh, authorization service, uh, which is used for any service that needs to ver uh, verify a token. So it verifies the signature and then returns the allowed permissions. Uh, we have then a set of microservices um, that um, are used to send the uh, the workflow through a queuing system. Uh, so we have an asset manager and a task manager, uh, which uh, creates the jobs and tracks the status of the jobs through the queue. And we have a series of asset workers and manifest workers that work with the queue to uh, validate the asset, add the asset to the database, and then uh, create the manifest uh, or consume it if it's provided, uh, convert it if necessary, and then other manifest services to then add it to the database and add it to the cache and so forth. Uh, so that's a real quick overview of this document here. And I will provide these uh, diagrams um, for download if you're interested in taking a uh, more in detailed, uh, more detailed look. Um, so I've got about a minute and a half left. So we're just going to quickly go through these other slides here. So uh, asset ingest, uh, the workflow from a tenant perspective is that um, our tenants, they load their images into an S3 bucket. They generate a manifest. Um, they sign a JOT token, which is then can be verified by our central authorization service. Um, they create a request JSON with the assets and manifest in it. And then they submit a request to the ingest API and then at that point, uh, the ingest goes through the pipeline that we just looked at in that previous slide. And then lastly, I'm going to quickly show um, how our asset delivery works. Um, so less than a minute left, so I'm going to quickly walk through this. Um, so for, for the asset delivery, it starts um, at the viewer and uh, on the top left here, uh, this workflow diagram. So we can see that uh, the asset delivery component um, sends a request to the lookup component. So each one of these columns is a different uh, microservice that we have. Um, so the lookup returns the, the policy information, which then takes the token and sends it to our login service. Um, there's a, then a handoff process, uh, which verifies the token through our authorization service. And then um, once that is authorized, it goes through uh, a proxy, which then selects the correct uh, image server. We have multiple instances of the image server that use different encoders. And that is about my time here. Um, but as I mentioned, I will be uploading these slides and documents um, onto the Code for Live website. Um, so if anyone's interested in taking a closer look, feel free to, um, to download them. And of course, let us know if there are any questions about anything. Um, we're more than glad to help.
So that wraps up uh, my presentation. I hope you can hear the applause. Oh, great. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. All Thanks right. very much for having me. All right. So do, 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 do. I'm just going to yank this and assume that it's all going to be fine. I'm going to give you this. And I'm going to do this. And do make sure this comes back up. Um, and while that is happening, I will announce our last talk of this block. The only thing other than some announcements between you and lunch. Um, no pressure. Uh, <clears throat> Alan Berry uh, Brachio, is that how you say it? Sure. sure. Uh, how library websites transform through time. And is your talk? Yes. Yeah, sure. uh, OK. Do you, no, no, not that one. That one. Do you want uh, presenter mode? That would be great. All right, let's see. Why is this thing not doing the thing? Uh, oh, OK. Yeah, we're going to do the thing. Remind it that it wants to be a thing. <clears throat> oh. Okay, let's see if that HDMI cable got loose when I unplugged it. Oh, oh, it's thinking. It has finished thinking. All right, let me get some presenter notes up here. And then I'll do this over here. And then I'll do bloop. And then... Your timekeeper is this gentleman. You have 10 minutes. OK. All right. Uh, take it away. Hi. I'm keenly aware that I'm uh, standing in the way of lunch, so I'll try and make this fairly brief. There's the internet stuff. Hi. My name is Alan Berry. I'm uh, with the University of Illinois at Chicago Library. Illinois, sorry. Um, and I am here talking about um, this software that I've, that I've been working on for the past few years called Brachio. Uh, originally it was called Apato after an Apatosaurus. Uh, I have kids who are into dinosaurs. Um, I was informed by a colleague though that um, Apatosaurus actually means I think something like devious lizard in, in Latin, so I, had, I moved on to letter B. Um, and uh, the reason for this is because Brachiosaurus is a, is a uh, canopy feeder. Um, back in the late Jurassic, he, he liked to, to eat on, on tall trees. My trees are basically the web and the, uh, the Wayback Machine. Um, I'm interested in learning about how library websites develop through time and kind of how they change. And I started this back in 2019. COVID kind of knocked it to the side. So. <laughs> Um, some of my data is a little bit old um, because a lot of this work happened a little while ago, but I recently rebooted it for, for this. So please pardon if there's any missing data anywhere. Um, so as I said, I'm interested in, in how library websites develop over time. Um, I read a book um, uh, recommended by my, my late boss, um, uh, Bob Sandusky, about um, how Buildings Learn, What Happens After They're Built by Stuart Brand. Great book if you haven't seen it. It's about how buildings change over the life of, you know, over, over their lifetimes. You might have someone who adds on a new wing or removes one or adds a new coat of paint. Um, it's not exactly a perfect metaphor for websites because every website, as you know, like gets uh, chopped down and rebuilt every five years. But I'm trying to find out, like, what are the through lines that, that connect um, a current website with something that was a few years back, perhaps, um, that, that might not even be known anymore. And how can we analyze these websites, uh, pref preferably by their, uh, their own internal data? Like, how can you analyze the actual HTML and CSS and JavaScript within the website to be able to learn more about it and to kind of project, um, you know, to be able to gather metrics about it? And then finally, I'm also interested in, uh, from, from my own personal research, I've been doing work on um, catalogs for a long time, especially like uh, um, art exhibition catalogs and things. So what might a research catalog of library websites look like? It's a little bit of a, of a, of a stretch to imagine a catalog of, of websites that aren't really meant to, to, to live in this sort of world. So um, if, if you did make that what, would that, what would that look like? I mean, obviously, I'd like it to be... Um, open source and transparent. Um, maybe someday it'll look like Pinterest, but it's not there yet. Um, but at least it's, it's, even though Pinterest is not very open source. But um, 
Yeah. So this this is it. If you're interested, you're welcome to to check it out. Hopefully, it doesn't fall down. I'm doing all this myself. Um, Brachio merges library website data with with that parent institution, so you can actually see. You can kind of sort by, um, say, an enrollment of an institution, or it doesn't. I realize it doesn't work that well on phones, so you might want to look at it on a desktop. And as I said, I'm interested in seeing how library websites um, look when they're visualized. Um, so to make web librarians like me. Uh, to make informed decisions in the future, um, to, to see what technology is being used by peer institutions, um, and also just kind of see um, how, how it all fits together. So and maybe in the future, this might actually be to complement uh, web archiving techniques. Um, I wouldn't say that this is any sort of replacement for, for work files or anything, but um, still, it, you could kind of view it as a radical uh, migration as opposed to an emulation. I mean, there is a role for um, kind of a snapshot of these websites um, in, in, in addition to actually being able to emulate them in the future. Also, I'm just kind of interested. To do this, I, I wrote a, 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 a kind of a web scraper called Visitor. Um, very, very creative, I know. But um, it, create, it collects these things called visits. Um, there are some examples here if you, if you find the slides. So far, I've got like three gigabytes worth of data, which after hearing the word petabyte a couple times today sounds kind of tiny, but uh, it's a lot for me at the moment. Um, it's been a busy few years. I'm ready. Uh, Visitor's kind of broken recently, so uh, I'm rewriting it in TypeScript. So wait for a, a version two if you actually want to hack on any of the code. Um, but I've 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 collected screenshots from all these different websites um, in various sizes. I have full uh, desktop sizes, um, also mobile and tablet. Um, uh, been able to gather like what technologies are used to build different websites. Uh, for example, WordPress or PHP or anything like that. Um, a lot of those we can discover from the source code and, uh, and take note of them. Um, the structure of the HTML and, and the CSS rules, we have all of those. A uh, list of all the outgoing links. It'd be nice to be able to do some network maps at some point to see what different websites um, you know, point to. And, and I have uh, various uh, metrics of um, complexity and maintainability, um, including uh, from Google Lighthouse, uh, measures of accessibility and performance and best practices. So. Um, so I have about 370 URLs, um, about 1,600 visits to those URLs, um, in addition to some external data for um, just to kind of like contextualize this stuff from the ARL and from the feds. Um, this is built in Node.js, uh, using Puppeteer for a lot of the screenshots and scraping. Um, like Google Lighthouse has been really great for providing some really um, kind of common denominator um, um, metrics for these different sites. So you can kind of compare apples to apples. Um, some other node libraries for analyzing JavaScript and, and CSS. Um, and then with um, some infrastructure in the back end, Netlify for the, for the app itself and Amazon for the, for the storage. I also have a MongoDB um, database. So this is kind of what my, my, my Data is starting to look like. Um, I'm picking on, on Michigan because it's my uh, my alma mater from back in the day. But um, this is these two examples kind of show what I'm starting to see as a trend. Um, you can see the you can't really see too well the the keys here, but the yellow line um, is a measure of. Um, wish I could see it. I think that's the uh, the performance one. But you, and and then the complexity is the green one. You can see that the complexity has gotten. Uh, down means bad and, and, and up means good in this case. Um, so you can see that over the, over the years, um, websites have gotten less performance and, 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 but, but have better, better practices and more accessibility. As you can, I also don't have data since 2021, so some of this has changed. I know like Michigan State did a re recent um, overview, I mean, over, overhaul of their website, and I'd like to be able to see that in my data as well. Um, but, uh, but of course, um, computers have gotten faster over time, so this, the performance metrics don't really show up the way that you might expect. Um, here is an example of a website over time, kind of visually. You can start to see, I love, I love the example of this. The reason I chose MIT, because I love this uh, Mondrian-looking example from 95. But um, this kind of shows the, 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 mid, the, mid, the mid aughts were kind of a sad time for, for uh, walls of text. And uh, it's not just MIT, it's like everybody. Um, and nowadays, everybody has these more stacked, kind of mobile-friendly designs that are a little more uniform and, and uh, 
and this is pretty common across the board. So that's it. I'll let you guys get to lunch. Um, if anybody is interested, please give me a line. I'm interested also in finding any other Node.js developers out there. So get in touch. Thanks. Alan will not be taking questions in deference to lunch, I guess. All right. <clears throat> but there is one more thing that stands between you and lunch, and that is pre-launch announcements, of which there are several. If you are going to be giving a talk this afternoon, please make sure your talk is on this computer um, during lunch. Sorry. Um, also, now is a great time to sign up for a lightning talk if you have not yet done so, or suggest a breakout session. I'm not sure if the breakout session one is up yet, but um, do we know how many lightning talk slots are left for this afternoon? One? I don't know. I thought someone said one. I don't know. Look out there, you'll see it. Um, lunch, uh, I'm gonna say where lunch is <laughs> at the end. All right, lightning talks. So lots of slots left. Please sign up for lightning talks, they're awesome, it's fun. It's a great opportunity to get in there. Someone was asking, what is a lightning talk? Um, basically, you get up here, you talk for five minutes about something, whatever. Um, slides optional, but encouraged. Um, so if you have like a project or you're doing and you want some input or if you didn't get your talk in but you still want to talk about the thing you want to talk about, Lightning Talks are great. Or if you like want to complain about Apple products, also an excellent venue. Um, uh, the one thing about if you do do slides for your Lightning Talk, don't plan to have presenter notes available. It's just too hard to, we want to up and down real quick. So, so just make, if you do slides, just plan to be able to talk off the cuff or have an excellent memory. Um, but if you have not ever done a lightning talk, I encourage it, especially new folks. We love new folks who do lightning talks. So sign up, talk about something, five minutes. How, how hard could it be? How, how, how terrible could those five minutes of embarrassment be? It's, it's a limited window of horror. Um, okay, and it really, we're, we're lovely people, I hope. It's not gonna be horrible. Um, okay, now the important stuff, lunch is at the, pro at, not the Prospect House, I guess it's at Prospect House, a short walk along the 1975 walk, whatever that is. Uh, the most direct path is to head up those weird stairs, um, go through that dining area thing, turn left up the other stairs, out the front doors of Frist, whichever doors those are, then go past the music building, whichever building that is, and turn left to get to the Prospect House. I definitely understood every word of that. Um, so it's wide brick road, and then it's to the left. OK. Um, all right, lunch will end at 1.15. Be back here at 1.15 for the next set of stuff. Thank you very much, and thank you to the AV crew. Take your stuff with you. That note got removed. Take this building will remain open and unsecured during our lunch break. Bring any important belongings with you. Come back here by 1.15. We'll start without you. Okay. I think we opened a new tab. Yeah. It's already a new tab. And mm -hmm. this is the computer. And I guess we. Do you know the URL? Mm hmm. All right, what do we, what do we need? <laughs> I'm trying to find my URL. Hold on, let me find my slide. My slide. Um, okay, my URL is right here. Oh, that's fun. a 